This is Michael from Blue Sky Bio, and I'd like to thank everybody who's joining us for tonight's webinar presentation. We're continuing with our 2017 webinar series, Building Your Practice with Guided Surgery and Blue Sky Bio. There's a lot of action and updates going on. We've actually uploaded a new Blue Sky Bio, Blue Sky Plan build to the Blue Sky Bio website with some new functionality. Um, so stay tuned for updates and stay tuned for upcoming webinar educational events that are going to be coming in upcoming weeks and months. We have a great schedule planned out with a lot of fantastic speakers and a lot of very interesting topics. As usual, if you have questions during the presentation, please enter them into the chat box next to the viewing screen and we'll ask uh, Corey to address them during the presentation. And please make sure to complete the attendance form so that we can send you the CE credit. For tonight's presentation, we have the honor and pleasure of hearing from Dr. Corey Glenn, an educator and innovator. He's the co-founder of the Blue Sky Bio Academy, which is doing fantastic things for dentistry, educating many, many different dentists, and providing a tremendous amount of added value. Tonight's topic, patients want teeth, not implants. Corey, we're handing the mic over to you. All right, thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Yep, you sound great. Great, okay. So yeah, I appreciate you having me back to do this and uh, always honored to do it. And uh, as always, really appreciative for everything that you and the, the software team and everybody at Blue Sky Bio is doing because uh, man, this software is just growing by leaps and bounds and uh, just amazing some of the stuff that's coming. Um, I think it's gonna keep us all busy for many, many years to come. So I really do appreciate the honor of talking. Uh, when Michael approached me about doing this one, you know, everything in the past we've done has been geared either towards surgical, you know, with guided surgery or uh, with just the guided uh, software. Uh, we don't really have a lot of content on the actual process of restoring the implants. And Blue Sky being an implant company, that's a big deal. So uh, he asked me to make this webinar and really focus on the restorative aspect of implantology. And hence my, my title, Patients Want Teeth and Not Implants. So I'm going to jump right in. Uh, as usual, the legal stuff, all the pictures are mine unless otherwise noted, no alterations. I'm not receiving any compensation, direct or indirect, for this presentation. Some of the products that you're going to see uh, were supplied or discounted by Blue Sky Bio, and then some of them from Burbank Dental Lab as well. I'll try to make notes when that uh, is the case. And I do have a financial interest in Blue Sky Bio Academy. Uh, I'm co-owner co of that. Uh, if you don't know what that is, we are a online uh, teaching um, business. We have online memberships to teach the guided surgery process. We're going to have the digital ortho. All, all things Blue Sky Bio and digital dentistry, we try to be an online resource for those. Uh, so I hope you'll check us out on that. We also do give many live courses. We'll be in LA this weekend, Miami next month. Um, lots of courses going on all the time. If you go to blueskybio.academy, uh, look on the courses and live events tab and you can see all of the upcoming courses. We'd love to see you in a live course. So let me start with this question. Is implantology a surgical or restorative discipline? So this has been argued about by uh, clinicians for the longest, as long as implantology has been around. And it started out that it was a surgical aspect and uh, it was only handled by the surgeons. But there's so many of these uh, different things that we have to bring into consideration when we're looking at restoring implants. And, you know, my argument is that it's neither a uh, surgical or a restorative discipline. It's obviously both. You can do the best implant surgery in the world. And if the restoring doctor makes a mess of it, uh, it's not a successful case and vice versa. Uh, you can do absolutely terrible surgery and the greatest restorative dentist in the world is not going to be able to bail you out. So it really is both. However, it's all irrelevant unless the patient ends up with the result that they are happy with. Meaning that I consider it a success if it's aesthetic, if it's cleansable, if it's functional, it's stable, it's going to last the patient. And so, really what we're after is this idea that patients want the teeth. They don't really care that you put the implants in the right position and all that stuff. They just want some teeth at the end of the day. 
And so I'm going to say patient uh, implantology is really a patient driven discipline. Uh, we've always got to make sure that it's, it's neither surgical nor restorative. It is those things, but we've always got to keep the patient and their goals and desires at the heart of this process. So when I look at a case like this, you know, I'm starting out from the very first time I meet the patient and look in their mouth, I have to have all of these different aspects in mind. And we've really got to nail all of those different aspects if we're going to come out with a successful case in the end. So I've talked about this numerous times. I've actually shared this case before. This um, is just a demonstration of what we uh, have talked about many times in the surgical software. So we're going to do restoratively driven treatment planning. So it starts before we ever make an incision. We're going to be planning out virtual teeth. We're going to be planning our emergence of the screw based on those positions. Uh, we're going to develop the surgical guide from that. And then when we go into the surgery, we have to think about the, the tissue contours. Are we going to need to add bone? So this is where the surgical uh, skill comes in. So when I looked at this patient, I wanted to bulk out that concavity of tissue that you're seeing on the, on the uh, uh, buckle of that ridge. And so when I'm making these incisions, I'm, I'm also thinking, am I going to do a single stage surgery? Am I going to do a uh, two stage surgery? So I make a lingually displaced incision generally uh, across the board. And then I'm gonna put my guide on, I'm gonna do my osteotomies via the guide to put them in that restoratively driven position. The implants will go into place. And in this case, I chose to bury them. Uh, but when getting back to the lingualized incision, what I wanna do either at the day of surgery or at uncovery is I wanna push that lingualized incision well over to the buckle. And you can see here how much uh, keratinized gingiva we gained and how much better the ridge form looks just from that simple modification. Uh, so again, very important to keep all of these things in mind. And then by doing some custom abutments, we were able to get a really nice end result. Uh, going back to the, the theme of needing to know all of these disciplines, I look at this uh, on the day of delivery and I'm concerned about those papillae, but again, if you know your rules, uh, five millimeters from the bone up to that contact point, and we know we're going to be able to predictably fill in that papilla. So the point of all that being is the guided surgery, at least for me, plays a huge role in this because I'm figuring out many of these things before I'm ever laying a flap or, or doing anything to the patient. And I know what I can and what I can't accomplish from day one. And that really helps with setting expectations and getting a good result for my patients. And this was her final result. So as I mentioned, we need to know all the different parameters. Uh, Tarno has the famous study that tells you about the contact points. So if you're five millimeters or less from crest of bone to the contact point, 100% of the time nearly that is going to fill in with the papillae. And as you get farther and farther away, you're going to have less and less papillae fill in. We need to understand and appreciate things like the implant positioning. Dr. Merzion has done an, a webinar just on this topic. And so we start thinking about our positioning of the implant. If I place this implant into uh, this position in a premolar socket, this is gonna end up with a really nice emergence on the crown. Uh, you can see with the virtual abutment in there what kind of contours I get, and I've outlined there the uh, natural tooth contour, and it's gonna be very easy to achieve those contours. Then we start looking in the posterior and we start thinking, well, if we do a one size fits all approach and we place the bone level implant right at the crest of the ridge, are we gonna be able to get a similar result? And the answer is with a particular abutment, we might not. We might end up with these really abrupt emergence profiles on the crown, which can end up a food trap and causing all sorts of problems for our patient. And we can end up with situations like this. And so none of us wanna be facing this uh, when it comes time to restore that. So it's super important that everybody be on the same uh, page with this. So how could we address that? Do we move it over? We're gonna get a better mesial contour. No, that's not really gonna fix it because it just makes our distal one worse. And so in this case, what I elected to do is move it down apically. And by doing that, I'm able to get a better emergence contour out of the bone on that abutment and get a more natural uh, profile to this restoration. And I also need to know and appreciate what type of implant I'm using. With some implant styles, this is a disastrous thing to place that implant that subcrestal. Uh, with a conical connection platform switched implant, that's not as big a deal. In fact, it's almost advantageous for the emergence reasons that I mentioned. So, 
you really need to know both sides of the spectrum on this. And if you're not a doctor who is placing and restoring all of your own, I highly recommend a team approach with a, a specialist or a referring doc that you can team up with and both of you got to know your roles and really work together on this to make sure you're on the same page of what's going to achieve an ideal result. So with that said, I'm going to go ahead and just go through some basic implant procedures. Uh, we'll start out with some simple stuff, impressioning techniques and things like that, and then we'll move into the more complex techniques uh, towards the end of the procedure, and hopefully we'll be able to get through all this. So the first thing I wanted to show you is just how to pour up an implant model. It's one of the most basic procedures that we need to do if we're going to be uh, restoring any implants. And in this case, I'm going to actually show the Blue Sky Bio custom abutments. Uh, if you're not aware that they have those, we'll talk a little bit about those as well. Uh, for what it's worth, the implants that I'm going to be restoring and showing in this webinar are the Blue Sky Bio Max implants. This is Nobel uh, Active compatible. I really love this implant. I place it exclusively uh, for a lot of reasons. It's a really versatile implant in that it's got tons of sizes, diameters from 3.0 up to 7.0. Uh, we've got lengths from 16 millimeters down to as short as 6 millimeters. Uh, so you're never really in a situation where you can't find the right size implant. I also love that you've all, you've got the option to use a single restorative platform across all of those different implant sizes. And so you can use that narrow platform connection, whether it's a 3.0 implant or a 7.0 implant. Uh, the wider it gets, the bigger platform switch you get. And so the bone seems to really love these implants and I've had great success with them. They are aggressively threaded and uh, their conical connection, uh, the bone maintenance around them has been really, really nice. So this is what I'm gonna mainly be demonstrating purely because that's what I mostly place. And this is what I was mentioning that uh, it does have a single restorative platform. You do have the option of a larger platform. However, that was really designed and released just because people felt like you need it. You don't really gain anything strength wise from going to a larger diameter uh, uh, connection. In fact, it's the contrary. If you look at the case of a 4.3 platform implant, if you have a narrow platform uh, connection in that, it is actually the stronger connection than it would be to put a larger platform or the DP connection in that. And the reason is very simple because when you place these restorations, the fatigue testing shows that when it, when it breaks, it's never the abutment connection that it breaks. It's the implant itself. And if you think of that smaller, you're using a 4.3 implant in both cases, if you're using a smaller platform um, uh, abutment, that allows the implant walls to be thicker. Whereas if you take that same 4.3 implant and you expand out now and you're putting a larger connection in it, you are now weakening the wall of that implant because you've had to thin it out for that larger uh, restorative platform. And so I really love this one size fits all approach. And then you can choose healing abutments, abutments, all of that stuff. Um, can, you can develop whatever emergence you want on it, but they all will start from that same uh, platform. And again, these are the sizes that are available, really versatile. And just a little slide showing this is how they look in the bone. And you can see it doesn't matter if I put this healing abutment onto this implant or this one onto this one. I'm purely choosing these healing abutments based on the desired emergence that I want to create. Uh, you can modify these if you don't like the more square uh, look to these. I like to develop sometimes a trumpet shaped uh, emergence to these healing abutments. I think that gets a little better um, platform switch and bone maintenance. And Blue Sky now actually does have healing abutments that are already made that way. Uh, so that's a little bit about the implants that I'll be showing. So let's talk about the impressioning process. Uh, we've got the option to do an open tray or a closed tray impression. Now, what does that mean? Uh, what you see on the left in the middle here is just the basic Biomax uh, impression transfer. And this transfer can be used in an open or in a closed tray impressioning method. Really, the only difference is going to be the screw length. And so if you're doing an open tray impression, you can put a much longer screw onto this that will stick up and out of the tray. And when I'm saying open tray impression, what I mean is that you cut a hole in the actual tray and you'll, you'll let that uh, impression transfer protrude through when you're taking your impression. And then you don't just remove the impression, you will actually unscrew the screw, 
so that this will come out inside the impression. It never leaves the impression. Uh, versus a closed tray impression, which is what this one is that I'm showing uh, right now, is where you would put this on with the short screw. Uh, you would do your normal impression, just like you were taking a, an everyday impression on a patient, and then you pop it out of the mouth. This stays in the mouth, and then you remove it, and you can attach an analog and pop it back into the impression. So just to get the terminology right, that's what I'm talking about when I say open versus closed tray impression. So this one, we, again, we've done a closed tray impression, and now I'm ready to assemble the analog. So I've got an implant analog and the impression transfer. We can now assemble those with the basic screwdriver, and we need to pop this back into the impression now. So once this is assembled, you're going to insert it back into the hole, and you notice these flat sides. There's three flat sides on this for indexing, and you can stick it in any one of those three ways, but the idea is that it goes in nice and smooth. There's no sharp corners on this to catch it. And it's going to pop back into the same position that it was in when it was in the patient's mouth and the impression material was setting up. So once we've done that, we have our analog back in place inside the impression. Uh, this is my, my cheapskate's way of doing the uh, soft tissue cast. So a soft tissue cast is helpful on an implant model. Um, it just allows us to be able to develop better contours on the restoration without having to, to chop at the stone and dig it out. And so what I'll do is I'll coat around this uh, on the PBS material with a little Vaseline or any separator that you want to use. And then there are plenty of actual soft tissue model materials that you can purchase. I have uh, some you know, from a major supply brand that's very affordable. Uh, but just, just for simplicity, a lot of people don't want to stock that. And so it's actually very easy if you want to just use your medium body impression material, as long as you've applied that separator right here, it won't stick to this impression. So the only downside to this is that you end up with a blue or a green or a whatever color soft tissue model as opposed to pink. Some lab technicians like the pink to help them visualize color better. Uh, but for most people, I've not seen that they really care too much. So I'll squirt that around. And the idea is that we want to pick up all these soft tissue contours, but we don't want to allow that to drop into the contacts here, which might screw up the contacts. We want all those to be in stone. And we also don't want to go too high up the implant right here, because these are the uh, features of the analog that are going to embed and lock that analog into the stone model. And so we're going to do it about to this level, just over the connection, and that should be sufficient. And then we're going to pour this up using a good quality stone. And I always recommend that you uh, weigh and measure your stone and your water. Personally, I find it easier to just use these pre-mixed packages or pre-measured packages because then I can open it up, pour it in, and just add the specified amount of water. There's no weighing or anything that way. And then we're going to put it on a stone vibrator and we're going to very carefully flow in stone all through this impression. And then also onto this implant analog, making sure that the stone gets into all of those little indexing features there. And once we've done that, it's very important also, I think, to let the impression sit upright. Now, the reason you see me doing it like this, and I think this is probably the best way to do it, is because I don't want to now flip this impression over. And let's say that this implant analog is just barely under the stone. And when you flip it, it compresses a little bit and it now distorts the positioning of this implant um, transfer and analog complex within the model. And that's an error you may not ever pick up on, but when you get the crown or the abutment back, you're going to notice that something's off. And that's because sometimes this can shift during setting. So I like to make sure that this is sitting upright, that there's nothing that's going to put pressure onto that analog within the, uh, the setting stone. And then once that's poured up, we can separate the impression again. We can remove that uh, impression transfer, and we now have our working model. Uh, the lab technician is going to be able to remove this soft tissue mask if they need to for imaging or uh, creating better contours or emergence, whatever they need to do. And so it makes a very quality model for them to do the crown and bridge fabrication. And then always get a bite, obviously, and an opposing uh, model as well. This is assuming you're doing it the analog way. If you're doing it digital, you'll do the, the digital um, uh, component to this or, or the, the same way digitally. 
And then your lab is going to take over from there. So in this case, we were doing a custom abutment. And so this is the custom abutment being designed. I believe this is in three shape software and they have total control over all of the parameters when they're making these custom abutments. So be very specific when you're making your lab prescription, tell them exactly what you want, what kind of contours, the more info and the more input you give them, the better off you're going to be and the better results you're going to get. And this was the resulting abutment that I got back. It was exactly to my specs. Uh, I like these rectangular shaped abutments that still have a little anatomy to them. That's more like a, you know, a tooth stump would be after you prepped it for a crown. And you can also see this nice trumpet shaped emergence like I like to do on my healing abutments as well. So speaking of that, if I was to list out my ideal custom abutment, these are usually the things that I put on the lab slip. I want it to be rectangular and not round. And part of the reason for that is one, I just like having that larger uh, stump, again, like a prepped tooth to cement my restoration onto. But the other reason is because I don't like a round uh, or cylindrical shape to it because then there's, there's the potential for your restoration to rotate around that. They're going to be more prone to becoming uns uncemented and they're just harder to index in general. So I want to make sure it's, it's more anatomically shaped and has some rectangular features to it to index it and to help it stay on better. I want that trumpet shaped emergence. So I want it, I want to take advantage of that platform switch like I have in this Biomax implant and I want to keep it skinny. And then as I approach the tissue, then begin my emergence out but I don't want to do that abrupt emergence down close to the bone level. I'm generally going to keep it a half millimeter subgingival on the facial, equigingival on the mesial and distal, and then half a millimeter supragingival on the lingual because lingually it's not going to be an aesthetic issue. Uh, that's going to be really helpful in pre preventing cement sepsis. Uh, I, I generally don't think cement sepsis is an, ever an issue you need to worry about on a cemented restoration if you design them this way and if you don't go nuts with your uh, cement in the restoration. I've just not seen it be a problem whatsoever. And then as far as the margin, I like to do a one millimeter chamfer margin. You could also do a shoulder margin. Either of those work, but I do want a definitive margin. I don't want it to be a little feather margin because that is more prone to driving cement apically or subgingivally. And then finally, I like to have them put a little retention groove into it. So you'll see what I mean on that. This is another case that we did recently. Actually, my associate did this one. And so you see the impression transfer in place. And this was sent to Burbank Dental Lab. And so just today, we're announcing that Blue Sky Bio is actually working now with uh, Burbank Dental Lab. Uh, their custom, uh, the custom abutment service we've been offering is phenomenal. Uh, it's always been excellent, but one of the complaints some people had was that it was just the abutment and you couldn't do a restoration. Well, that problem is solved now. Uh, you can send this to Burbank. Burbank can do the um, custom abutment and the restoration for you, and so you can get it back much quicker, and they do a really, really nice job. So it's just one more option that you can do through Blue Sky Bio, and it's really affordable option. I believe if you just send the impression and they do all the rest, uh, it's 180 for the custom abutment, which is a really, really good price. And then there's graduated pricing as you go down. So if you supply the scan body, if you supply the, uh, uh, the milling blank or different things, the price goes down accordingly with all of those. So you can actually get custom abutments really affordable uh, if you do those things. So this is what I described to Burbank that I wanted for my custom abutment. And a few things you should notice, again, is this trumpet shaped emergence, maintaining that crestal bone and making sure that I don't pinch that uh, and cause an issue there. I've got this rectangular shape to it. It's going to help with indexing the crown more and it's going to make it more retentive. Uh, it's also going to keep a uniform thickness to the restoration once I make it. Uh, you can see the little retention groove that's been placed in the lingual in this case. And then you can see that one millimeter margin. And it's hard to tell from the... Uh, the pictures, but this is looking from the facial. That's a half millimeter subgingival. Uh, you can kind of tell on this larger picture that the lingual is a little bit supragingival and then equigingival on the mesial and distal. And so this was the final restoration. They did a wonderful job of staining this. This is a full zirconia crown, which is pretty much my go-to material uh, these days. 
and that cements on. Uh, you can see on the facial just that little bit of compression of the tissue, which is exactly what I want. It looks perfectly natural, and these are restorations that just disappear into the mouth. So can't recommend that highly enough. Burbank has done an exceptional job for me in the ones I've been testing with them on this. All right, so that's really it for pouring up the impression. Now let's talk about a, a different method of doing the impression. Let's talk about now doing an open tray impression, and I'm going to demonstrate what's called the MPA abutment or the multi-purpose abutment. And so as you see it right here in the middle, this is how it will come packaged if you order it from Blue Sky Bio. And you can order this in different sizes. So you can get these in different emergence sizes that basically match the same emergence on the uh, healing abutments. So you can get a 3.5, a 4.3, uh, 6.0. You can really get a wide variation of these to match your healing abutment. And then if you get the MPA kit, it will also have the analog and the screw with it. So uh, use your imagination. Pretend this is the patient. I tried to help you out here and color the gingiva pink. Uh, but this was better for demonstration purposes. We're going to pretend this is the patient's mouth and they've got this implant in the in the bone, uh, tissues healed around it, and it's now ready to restore. How do we use this MPA abutment? What you're going to do first is you're just going to take the MPA abutment, put the screw in, and then I like to orient that flat side to the buckle. That's not uh, an absolute. You don't have to do that, but it's just helpful for me. Um, I'm going to orient that to the buckle and I'm going to screw this down. And generally in my, in my impressioning techniques, I'm gonna just go finger tight. I'm not gonna put a torque wrench to it at this point. So I will finger tighten that in all the way. And then these can be used in an open or in a closed tray impression method. So there's nothing that's really uh, sharp on any of these and you can re-index it like I showed in the previous case uh, with, a, with a closed tray technique but it's also got these retention grooves so that you could use it for an open tray technique as well. So you're going to take that impression tray and I prefer plastic on these or you could do a custom impression tray, but you're going to make a little hole there so that your, uh, your screw is going to be able to protrude up and out of that. Now, because this is just a normal screw that's uh, a little shorter on this, I make a little post that's going to stick out. It serves the same method and it's very easy to do. All I do is I take a little cotton tip applicator. I break off a, a centimeter or so of the end and it sits right down into the hole of that abutment. That keeps any impression material from getting in there, which is very important. You don't want it to get into the screw access channel and block yourself out from being able to get at the screw. Once we do that, we're ready to take the impression. So again, pretend this is in the patient's mouth. You, you take it into the mouth, you get it lined up over the, the hole that you've created, and you're gonna seat the impression. I prefer to use a, a heavy body impression material for most implant procedures, especially for a, a, a open tray impression because it's gonna retain that uh, uh, impression transfer more rigidly inside of the impression material. So I'll put that on. And then I'm going to take that same cotton tip applicator that I broke the end of off to put in the screw access channel. And I'm going to wipe away all of that excess around this because, again, I want to be able to pull this out and get access back to that screw channel. So the impression is going to set up inside the mouth. I use a two minute and 10 second uh, material. And then before you can remove this, if we're doing an open tray impression, now we have to remove the screw and disengage that uh, impression transfer. So very simple, pop out the uh, little Q-tip tip that you've stuck in the screw access channel, and that leaves you very good access to go in and now unscrew this. And once you feel the screw disengage, now you can remove the impression as a whole from the mouth. And when you do, you'll see the impression transfer, or in this case, the MPA abutment come with this. And so now it will be the same as doing the, uh, the model work that we did earlier in the prior case. We're going to put on an impression transfer. I'm sorry, uh, implant analog. You're going to make sure that that implant analog is fully seated. And then you can do the soft tissue cast. This, is, again, is a soft tissue colored type, but you could use your PVS or whatever. Just make sure you lubricate between the two materials so it doesn't stick. And again, make sure you only bury it to just over the connection. You don't want to cover up any of these indexing portions on the analog. 
And then we're going to begin flowing in the stone. And so I do this very slowly and gradually. I want to make sure that stone gets into every nook and cranny that I can get it into. And then we can bulk fill that. Uh, I, again, I don't invert the impression because I don't want to disturb that while it's setting. And when we separate everything, this is what we have. And we see that the MPA uh, abutment nicely recreated this uh, emergence profile that was matched to it. And we've got this nice working model now that our lab technician can use uh, to restore this implant case. Now, the nice thing about an MPA abutment and why it's uh, called that for multi-purpose abutment is that it just served as our impression transfer. But now the nice thing is that you can also use it as the final abutment. So this can be prepped as the abutment. So once you've gotten to this point and you've got a working model, and I do this all in my own office, you could uh, delegate this out to your lab technician. But once you've gotten to this point, now you can cut off that top portion, which is the indexing feature, and you can just prep this as a stock abutment. And so you can see that top part removed. What I usually like to do is I'll get a very sharp uh, metal cutting burr, like a 330 carbide, and I'll just buzz through this very, very quickly to get through that. And then I will switch to a diamond to prep the rest of the titanium abutment. So here we have that removed. Now we need to prep the titanium. And so you can see now I've prepped this. And I do, again, just like I do with my custom abutments, I try to maintain a little piece of a flat side uh, to make sure that there's an indexing feature to this, uh, a little anti-rotation to it. And now this can be used to fabricate the final restoration on this. And so uh, this is the final abutment now. The restoration gets made, it get, comes back to you, and you put this back onto the patient, you torque it down to 30 Newton centimeters, and now you can deliver the final crown. Again, this just being a demo case, I just made a little acrylic crown just to, be, uh, to show the whole workflow. But that's basically it on how to use an MPA abutment. The nice thing about these, they're very, very economical to use. Um, if you stock these, you've pretty much got what you need to restore most implants. The downsides to them, uh, you got to prep titanium. T titanium's not all that fun to prep. Uh, it's pretty hard, and so you can sometimes have some difficulty with that. And if you want to do the prepping yourself, that means you're either going to have to burn some back and forth time between yourself and the lab, or you're going to have to pour it yourself, and that way uh, have it in-house to do the preparation on it. Any questions on any of that so far, Michael? Yeah, there's a question that just came in now. Do you like screw mentables at all? Mountable, mentables. I, I do. Um, so what's being uh, referred to in this, and I think I show a case later uh, on this, but screw mentable is the idea that you can make a restoration now that has a screw access channel and you can actually bond these together before the case. So unlike a traditional screw retained crown where you would either use a UCLA abutment and wax it all up or you would use a tie base and have this uh, say a zirconium crown that bonds onto that you would just have the crown made the normal way with a screw access channel and then you can cement it together on the model and that makes for a nice screw retained restoration and to answer the question I actually like them better than a traditional screw retained crown because this is a much beefier connection. Uh, the abutment is gonna be much thicker than say a, uh, a uh, tie base would be. And so I think it's a great way of doing it. Um, but going back to what I said earlier, if you can follow those uh, margin designs that I, that I discussed, I'm generally finding it not necessary to do screw retained. And so screw retained is a little more technique sensitive on delivering the restoration because of the contacts and the path of draw. I find that my preference, if I could do anything I want to do uh, on a case, my preference is custom abutment uh, to the specs that I described earlier in a cementable crown. That to me, it just doesn't get any easier than that. And I've had phenomenal results. And worst case scenario, you need to remove it at some point in the future. What I will do is I will take a straight down occlusal shot of the abutment before I deliver it so I know where the screw channel is. That way if I ever have to get back in and access that, I can just prep right into that like an endo access and now I've turned it into a screw retained crown. So it's kind of the best of both worlds in my opinion. Any others?
Yeah. Are there tie bases for Blue Sky Bio implants? Absolutely. So if I can exit my presentation here for just a moment um, and go to blueskybio.com. I'll show you where they are. So let's shop online and we'll go to Biomax. And you've got these available for everything except for the uh, uh, one stage implant because that's tie bases and one stage implants don't mix. But here you see them uh, CAD CAM tie base right here. And these are very affordable at 60 bucks. You've got the long and the short. So they are a great option. And I actually showed some cases using that. Uh, here shortly. Okay. Are the CERA compatible? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, for example, when I'm when I'm using the Biomax implant with the narrow platform connection, um, that's again compatible to the Nobel Active narrow platform connection. And so, I in the CERAC software, I just designate it as a uh, Nobel Active. I think it's the NBA 4.5L is the actual uh, part number you designated as. Uh, you're not going to find Blue Sky's parts listed in your CEREX software, but again, we because we have the compatibility with these implant lines, you can just designate it as those other implant lines and then use the Blue Sky part, and there's a lot of cost savings in that. Are those abutments compatible with mobile implants? Uh, yes. On the narrow platform, they are. So Nobel has since added, I think, a, a larger platform than than even the regular, and so it would not be uh, that would not be the case for those. But for the others, uh, yes, the components are are interchangeable. Were you able to get the one millimeter chamfer with MPA? Unable to see it in the photo. Yeah, this is basically for a demo. I didn't want to wear my electric handpiece out because I already tear them up about every 30 minutes anyway. So I didn't do that. But yes, you can see I've got a ton of remaining thickness there to the uh, MPA abutments. So you can definitely get that. Perhaps not to the degree you could or definitely not to the degree you could on a custom abutment. And again, that goes back to why if I have my preference, it's going to be that custom abutment. Okay, I think we're good for now. Awesome. Okay. So the next thing I want to show is the closed tray impression method. And this time I'm going to demonstrate it using a KISS abutment. So again, most of the bone level implants and uh, the tissue level implants that Blue Sky sells are going to have the option to use what's called a KISS abutment. And so, uh, you know, the old Ackerman keep it simple stupid i don't think that's what Blue Sky stands for but that's what i'm going to say uh, these are just really simple to use and uh, you can be a stupid redneck like me and not mess this up so uh, this is how they come packaged you'll see them uh, as kits and you'll notice that it's a mostly anatomically correct abutment already and so a little different procedure to use these so again, we're gonna pretend this is our patient and this is a, a KISS abutment and I've placed that into the, to the mouth and I've torqued it down. And the unique thing about these is the when you place these, they never come off again. So we're gonna, the day we're gonna do the impression, we're gonna put this in and we're gonna put it to its final torque and it's not gonna come out of the mouth again. That's part of what makes it simple and many specialists like to use these uh, to send back and forth for their restorative docs because it just makes it so easy for the restorative doc. They're going to come in and pop on a transfer and take it. They don't have to go removing abutments and using screwdrivers and all of that fun stuff. So this is the abutment in place and you can choose either a wide or a narrow. And then you're going to have these little plastic caps that come into the kit as well. Now the one you see on the far left is the impressioning cap. And that is going to pop down onto the abutment. Again, remember, you don't remove this abutment. So we've got to have some way of transferring the data over to our lab. And the way you do that is with this impressioning transfer. So it's a very good snap fit. Excuse me. It's a very good snap fit to this. And you're going to be able to pop that on. And you'll notice a very definitive snap to it when it goes on. There's no question of whether it's in the right place or not. It's a very good snap. And here you see that in place, it goes over the lip of the, the implant 
and that is what indexes this into its uh, correct position. And then you're going to go ahead and do your close tray impression at this point. I thought I had a picture of that, but apparently I forgot to put it in. So now you're going to do an impression. Now this time, close tray. That means you don't have to create a hole in the tray or anything like that. You're going to do this just like a standard old impression. So again, I prefer to use medium body. I'm going to squirt it all into the nooks and crannies on this impressioning transfer down into the sulcus and all that. And then I'll just seat the impression into the mouth. And when it's two minutes is up and it's set, you just remove it like a standard impression. And once you do that, again, your patient is going to continue wearing this. And so you could just leave them in the abutment if you wanted to. But if you've developed nice emergence contours to the tissue like I have in this patient, <laughs> Uh, you're going to want to maintain those with a some kind of a temporary restoration. So if you decide you want to put a temporary onto this, there's a white cap in this little kit as well. So the white one would be next. We could pop that on. And now you could use a, uh, a pre-op impression or whatever you've done, a suck down, and you could put acrylic or bisacryl in there, seat it over this, let it harden, and it's going to embed itself onto this white cap and that now makes a nice temporary that you'll be able to remove on and off. Uh, it's got a very good taper fit. You, most times I don't even think you need cement with these because it kind of taper locks on. And so you'll remove this and trim up the margins, make sure there's no gross overhangs or anything. And because this fits down all the way to the lip of the abutment, it's going to make sure you don't get tissue impingement coming back up and over that implant abutment margin. Now for the lab procedure. So remember again, this was that impressioning transfer that we now have embedded in the impression. And then also in this uh, KISS abutment kit is this analog. Because remember somehow the, the lab has to get a model that has that, um, that abutment in the same position in space as what the patient has in their mouth. So it comes with this little analog, and this analog is exactly the same size as the uh, KISS abutment, which is in the patient's mouth, and it will pop into that impression transfer in the exact same way. And so you're going to take this abutment. Here's that impression that we took, and you notice that this stayed in the impression. I didn't have to remove it. It locked in and popped out when I removed the impression. Now we'll take this analog and we'll pop it down in here. Again, a very uh, definitive snap fit. You'll know when that's seated. And then the, the lab technician can pour this up. They can do a soft tissue model on it. All the same things that I've already shown a couple of times. And this now becomes the working model. And the lab can make this, uh, the restoration on this, and it's gonna fit exactly the same way into your patient's mouth. Now there's a few other caps. If you remember, there was a, a brown and a white cap in that little uh, kit that comes to you. And so what those are is waxing sleeves. So this is for your lab technician. Basically, all you need is that impressioning cap and you need the white cap if you're going to do a temporary and then you need the abutment itself. Those are the only things that the restoring dentist needs out of those kits. The rest of it goes over to the lab technician. The lab technician now on the working model can use the brown cap, and this is a waxing sleeve. The black one is a waxing sleeve as well. It's just a non-engaging one. It doesn't fit down into those little grooves. So this will fit precisely on. It's, it's sized exactly to fit over this KISS abutment, and the lab technician can now begin waxing up their framework. Let's say they're doing a, a PFM restoration for this. So they're going to need to wax up a coping first and then cast that. So that's what I'm showing right here. And this is the full contour coping. And then that comes off and this can be invested and then cast. And now that becomes your metal uh, sub subframe for the porcelain to be stacked on for this PFM. Or similarly, if you were doing a burnout and gonna press it in Emacs or any number of other materials. Uh, so very simple for the lab. And you can see, I, I mentioned the brown was engaging. That just means that it has these little indexing features that go into the KISS abutment where the black one does not have that. And so there may be situations where uh, the lab doesn't want to engage those little retention groups, splinted restorations or whatever. So just send all of that to the lab, let them deal with it. And then they're going to send you back the final restoration. Again, this is just a little acrylic crown I made, but that's the idea of how you can restore and do the impressioning process with these. Any questions on that?
Yeah, we have a bunch of questions that came in. Let me scroll back a little bit. Um, looks like the Nobel Snappy abutments, are they similar? They are. Many companies have these. Strauman has these. Uh, Nobel has these. Uh, quite a few companies have them, but it's the same premise on all of them. The idea is that the abutment can get placed one time, and there's actually some science to that. If you've heard of the concept of one abutment one time, the idea is every time an abutment comes on and off, you know, you're know you allowing bacteria to, to come into that uh, connection. Uh, you're disturbing the soft tissue that might have been attaching itself. So there is ad advantages to just putting an abutment in one time and then leaving it. And so that's what's going on here is it's just simplifying the process. You don't have to remove it and the impressions are, are a snap. I mean, that's a bad joke, but really, literally, they just, you pop it on and you take an impression. It could be all assistant driven. Okay. Could you digitally scan the abutment at the time of placement? If so, how do you develop the tissue contour? You could, that would not be my preference if I was doing these, but uh, you absolutely could. So you would just, you would place this abutment and then you would torque it to its final uh, torque and then probably have to powder it being silver. Uh, most scanners need a little help on, on silver surfaces and then you'll just interorally scan. Uh, you don't have anything to, to keep the tissue expanded out. And I'll talk in a little while about custom uh, uh, impression transfers. But if you, if you fiddle around for too long, you know that tissue starts to collapse in a little bit. So it might end up covering a margin and you have to pack a cord or whatever. That's just not my preference. If I'm gonna do one of these, I would so much rather just do the process I've shown where I pour up a working model and then do it on the working model because then everything's under control and I'm not fighting tissue with that. But you can if you want to, certainly. Okay. Um, next comment. I've noticed it's harder to seat the Emacs blocks the Blue Sky Bio tie bases than the Serona tie bases. Serona tie bases seat more easily. Blue Sky Bio tie bases bind with the block. Any tips? Uh, I, I've honestly I've not had that experience, so I, I'd have trouble commenting on that. Um, you know, I've done quite a few of them, and I've not noticed it. Uh, I've only done Biomax ones, but they're, I mean, they're sized to, to very high tolerances. So I don't know what the issue would be with that, to be honest. Sorry, I'm not much help on that. Any problems with removing cement on these if tissue is thick? Uh, it's not so much if the tissue is thick, it's if the margin is deep. Okay, so remember, these have a definitive margin already on them. And that is one of the disadvantages of this abutment type is that uh, it, it really doesn't give you a lot of flexibility. I think there's two different heights that you can go. You can go one and a half millimeters up or three millimeters up with this collar. But if you've got a case where you might have a five millimeter tissue depth, um, you're forcing this abutment onto a situation that it's not ideal for because no matter what you do, if you want to get a restoration down to that margin, you're going to end up several millimeters subgingival. So cement removal is a big issue to me and I, I'm very worried about it um, in all cases, but it's only an issue because of deep margins or uh, again, some of the issues I mentioned earlier. So in the right cir circumstances, these are phenomenal and there's nothing easier, but don't force them into every situation. It's kind of the same premise on the, the tissue level uh, implants. I'm not a huge lover of tissue level implants in general because they force me to live with this restorative margin that I uh, am placing on the day of surgery. So I like the, restore, the flexibility to be able to come back at a bone level and develop it to wherever I want it. So that's my two cents on that. Okay. We're good. All right. So let me get back to where I was here. So let's shift over now, and I might have this out of order, but we'll we'll go with it. So overdentures. So uh, we're not always restoring teeth on on implants. Sometimes we're doing dentures or using them to stabilize partials. And so Blue Sky offers some overdenture abutments. Uh, these are compatible to the uh, Zest locator abutments, so you can use Zest components on these and vice versa. Um, they work very well. The biggest thing that I like about Blue Skies, though, is that they have a new material that they've uh, developed a, a new retentive snap with. So if you placed a lot of this type of abutment, 
uh, you know that usually there's this metal housing and within that is nylon caps. Well, nylon makes for great fishing line, but I don't think it makes for great uh, overdenture housings. Um, there tends to be a, a tendency for it to pinch inside of there. It tends to wear out relatively quickly. And so the mines at Blue Sky Bio went back to the drawing board and what they found is this new material. Uh, it's a type of plastic that had really good properties. If I'm not mistaken, I was told that it's used in uh, cardiac uh, prosthetic heart valves. Uh, it's kind of important that those not wear out. And so they tried this material in the form of a snap. And uh, if you go on Dentaltown sometime, you can find the thread where when they were testing this, they set up a machine that uh, had an, a, 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 one of these super snap attachments and an, a, an abutment. And it was a straight on shot. It would push it in and it would pull it out, push it in, pull it out. And Sheldon started a, a thread on Dentaltown at the beginning of this, taking bets on how many uh, cycles it would go before it lost her attention. Because if you've looked at nylon, you know it's not going to be all that much. And there's pretty much a direct relationship in the number of cycles and the retention strength it has. It just goes down more cycling. So it was inter entertaining to watch and get people's speculation. And you look at this graph and this is what happened. Initially, the retention on these things went up, which is totally counterintuitive. And then they dived a little and then they more or less came back and they stabilized at roughly where they started out at and they just stayed there. Um, eventually the, the test was stopped at 250,000 cycles because they just couldn't wear them out. And why stop at 250,000 cycles? Well, that would be like your patient taking their denture out 10 times a day for 68 years to get to 250,000 cycles. Now, please hear me when I say this, I'm not telling you that you can use these and you're going to get 68 years of use out of these attachments. This was a bench top exercise. It didn't have food particles and abrasiveness and off angles and all, all the different things that come with being in a mouth. Uh, the mouth is not a kind environment, but the point is that it does have much, much better retention and much more uh, long lasting retention on this. So I highly recommend you try these out. This is what they look like. They are just a plastic piece. You notice there's no metal housing on this. And uh, the reason they're able to get away with that is because there's a little retentive bead on here. So usually it's the metal housing that has those retentive rings in it. In the case of these, that little retentive bead uh, that's slightly larger diameter is what will embed this into the acrylic of the denture. And so you don't need a housing whatsoever. You do a standard pickup just like you would with any other type of metal housing over denture abutment and you're gonna pick these up inside of the denture. This is how they come packaged. Uh, you can see that it comes with an abutment, uh, either three or five millimeter long, and then three levels of retention in that packet and the little block out ring so you don't get it blocked on. So they're very affordable. They're super easy to use. This is how I do my pickup procedure. There's probably a dozen ways to do it, but I like this. Um, I usually, for starters, I never have the lab do this because I've just not ever noticed the same level of precision on it when it's done on a stone model. So what I do is when I have the patient in healing abutments, I will uh, then do my master impression for the denture because then the lab knows where the implants are going to be and they create me a little uh, relief inside of that uh, over those healing abutments on the master model. I get the denture back. Um, then I need to put the housing on the abutment and the housing on, and I need to verify that it's sitting passively. So the way I do that is I use the cheapest bite registration, uh, paste from, you know, your, your supply house that you can get. Uh, this is Patterson brand, I think. And I squirt a little bead in there and I just seed it onto the, to the arch, um, just like that. And the reason I use this is because it's super fast setting, being bite registration material, uh, it's super cheap, and it pulls out cleanly. And so when I do that, I can look in there and I can see any areas of acrylic show through tell me that this was not seating passively. And it tells me where I need to adjust. So I'll take a burr to this and go right through this and I'll adjust that away. And I'll do this, usually it takes two to three times on and off. Uh, before I have it seating passively and I look into this and I don't see any acrylic showing through. Now I'm ready to do my pickup. So again, here we are, we're ready to do the pickup. Uh, I, I either use just my normal acrylic or I'll use this easy pickup, which Blue Sky Bio 
uh, sells on the website. It's a bisacryl type material. It's pink colored, uh, kind of similar to what you would make temporaries out of. And there's a little varnish that you can uh, get a chemical bond between the acrylic and this material. So you brush that in, you squirt in the easy pickup, and then you seat it over this. You can either use the blockout rings, or in this case, I was using a little bit of rubber dam. And you'll do the pickup. You let it set up inside the patient's mouth, and then you take it out once it's fully hardened. And this is what you have. Uh, any little areas where it might be laid over the edge of this, you could trim back uh, where it got into undercuts, but that's that's essentially it. Now, everyone always worries when they look at this, well, heck, what if I do need to change them out? I don't want to you know, do a whole new pickup procedure. And the answer is you don't have to. Remember those uh, retentive beads on this? So they all have that little retentive bead that you see right there. I can take this one and just pop it out with a scalar tip and I could get a, a new one or a different retention level and I could pop it right back in. Uh, you don't have to do a new pickup or anything. So I, I really love these. I've placed quite a few of them and I've had great success with them. I've been doing it under a year, so I'm not to the point of changing any of them out at a year. So I'll tell you when I start to. I don't know when that will be though. Um, if you opt to let your laboratory do the pickup, some people prefer to do that, um, but you can purchase them in this manner. This is for the uh, laboratory pickup. And so the difference with these, the way you'll use this little kit is the abutment will go on. And then similar to using a kiss abutment, you're going to just pop on this impression transfer. So this will pop on to the overdenture abutment. You'll just do a closed tray impression take it out of the patient's mouth and send it to your lab. The lab is then going to be able to take this um, uh, overdenture abutment analog, pop it into this, which is embedded in the impression. And then they can do the pickup and traditional acrylic uh, processing. It's really up to you how you want to do it. Uh, both ways work really well. Any questions on that? Yeah, we have a couple of questions that came in. Um, are Blue Sky Bio caps compatible with locator housings? Blue Sky caps bio and bio housings. Caps so there's two things there. I'm, I'm thinking locator housing, I'm thinking is the metal piece with the nylon in that. And yes, you can use that zest piece on a Blue Sky abutment. Uh, those, those will work. They are compatible together. You could also use these super snaps that I was just showing you, uh, these. You can use those on a zest locator abutment. So, yeah, they are compatible. I think I'm a little confused on the terminology there, though. Okay. Can I use this housing in my current locator patients? Will it work on a locator? Absolutely. That, that same, same thing. It's just the same question, vice versa. You will have to do a new pickup though. So if you've currently got the style that has the metal housing in it with a nylon ring, it's not like you're gonna be able to just pop out the nylon ring and pop this in. Uh, it's a different animal. There's, it's intended for no housing. And so it wouldn't fit into that even if you tried. So all you do is, is pop out the metal housing and just do a new pickup. And it's pretty simple. Okay, that's it for now. So the question came up about tie bases. And so uh, we do have tie bases available for all of these different blue sky implants, all of the bone level implants. Again, we have the tie bases for uh, if you're placing another brand implant uh, that's compatible to a blue sky, you could use our tie bases on that. Again, there's compatibility maintained with all of those. And then this is um, an Emax block. So if you're a CERAC user, you know you can purchase these Emax blocks that have the pre-milled hole in them. And those are per uh, perfectly sized for this Blue Sky uh, tie base to fit inside of it. So there's one little orientation notch right here that you'll see, and that will index itself in there. Once the restoration is made, you bond them extra orally, and that will create your screw retained crown or abutment, whatever you're doing. Again, 60 bucks on those, they're a really good deal. Uh, this was a case I did with CERAC where I did a split design abutment and crown. And so you can see here that uh, upon removing the uh, healing abutment, we had nice tissue contours. Uh, I put on the scan body. And so if you're a CERAC user or any other system that does intraoral scanning, 
same method. So the way I do it uh, is I'll put on the tie base and then I will use the, uh, I don't know if it's Serona or Patterson that sells them, but the little caps that index themselves on to the scan body. And then you can do your imaging of that. And then you can take that to the software and now be able to design your abutment and crown. So again, this one I'm making up for a slightly off angle implant placement, as you can see from the screw emergence. Uh, but it allows me to get this perfectly straight up and down parallel abutment. And this happens to be Emacs that I've uh, done the abutment uh, here out of. And so I've got an Emacs by Ivoclar uh, abutment and a crown on a tie base. Um, so it's a very affordable workflow. I forget the exact number it all came out to, but this is super affordable to do all of this. Uh, way, way more affordable than you can get from a lab if you choose to do it this way. Just another case, uh, this was actually one of the first guided surgeries that I ever did. I, uh, at that time, didn't know how to use the software yet, and uh, I had Cadre do the implant, the, uh, the implant positioning in the software and develop the stent and send it to me. And this was one of those cases that after I did this, I thought, man, I've got to figure out this guided surgery stuff because this is the way of the future. I just couldn't really see going back at that point. So you can see the planning that was done in the Blue Sky software here. Uh, you've got some uh, CAD CAM proposals here of where the teeth need to be in the right occlusion and then where the implant emergence is going to be based on that. And I had told them I wanted to do screw retained crowns. And so that's exactly what we did. So here you see a step from the uh, Serona software and all I've done is place the tie base on and then I've put the scan uh, cap onto that and done the imaging. And then you can design the restoration within the CEREX software or whatever system you're using. And again, we can do so much planning when we have this level of control. We can make our contact be five millimeters exactly to the level of bone. It's just amazing all you can do with this. And here you see the final emergence of the screw positions. And here they are milled out. And I've sandblasted the tie base. This is another case on the top. Sandblast this tie base and then use the uh, resin cement of your choice. I think I used multi-link abutment cement for this, uh, which is intended for that. And it's got a nice white opaque color, so it'll block out any uh, little thin areas where a tie base might show through. And you end up with a really nice screw retained restoration. This is what it looks like on the uh, x-ray. And so everybody always sees this and flips out initially thinking, oh man, it didn't seat all the way. It did seat all the way. Remember, pretend you don't see this transition here from metal over to the Emacs. Um, this is just a platform switched implant that you're seeing right here. So if this throws you for a loop when you look at it, I always tell people the way to tell if, for example, one of these Biomax or really any conical connection implant is fully seated when you're doing your check films, is look right here at the interface between the abutment and uh, the actual implant wall. If you can see that conical connection fully engaging right there, or in other words, you don't see any daylight in between right here, then you're good to go. If you can see daylight in between that connection, you're not seated, you're hanging up on bone or, or something's not right, and you need to address that first. So these were them in the mouth, Again, restored with CERAC, uh, abutments and crowns. So that's all for tie bases. Any questions on those? No, there are no new questions. Okay. Uh, I just didn't know where to stick this because it's kind of a random thing to throw in, but I did want to make you aware that Blue Sky also sells this opaquer. So, you know, sometimes you can use a titanium uh, tie base and a zirconium abutment, so a, a split abutment in that manner, I would not recommend ever using a completely zirconia abutment. The very few of those I've done have always come back to bite me. Um, I like ones on tie bases, but sometimes you just, you can't block it out enough. Or sometimes you need the strength of, let's say, a custom titanium abutment uh, for a really heavy occlusion or something like that. And you can't really block it out enough to get uh, a nice aesthetic restoration on top. Well, Blue Sky does sell this. It's called uh, white metal, and it's just an opaquer. And so the way you use this is you prime the abutment. You would sandblast it, prime it, paint this stuff on really thin, and it comes out to be a, a 
pretty muted tone of white color, which now becomes your, your substrate that you build the crown on. And so pretty affordable to buy these. And if you ever run into the situation where you need it, it's really nice to have. It's, it's for super gingival applications. So you shouldn't put this as the sole interface between an abutment and tissue. It's not intended for that purpose. Uh, it's intended to block out the color of metal on portions that are going to show. All right. So I'm going to start showing some uh, little different things and different ways of approaching stuff. And it's all variations on the same theme. But what I've given you so far is just the baseline of how to restore basic implants. OK, this is a, a technique that I've um, done several times. And I really like doing that because it, it very much expedites the process of placing and restoring the implants. So I had this odd occlusion case that I was doing here. The patient wanted to get an implant in this site. It had a pretty rough crossbite, a malpositioned root on that canine. Um, it was going to take a long, long time with the ortho to fix that, and the patient just wasn't having it. She just wanted a tooth in that. She didn't care about fixing the occlusion. So there uh, wasn't really any contraindication to doing that, so I agreed to it. Uh, definitely a case for guided surgery. It's not a place I would want to try to sneak an implant in freehand. And again, this was one of my early on uh, guided cases. And you can see again where we've got to sneak an implant into. So this, the planning was done. I ended up uh, doing a virtual design in Blue Sky Plan. And I made at that time a model based guide. Uh, if you've just gotten into this in the last couple of years, you probably don't know what that is. But the idea is that it would print you a model with a post sticking up in the proper position and trajectory of the implant onto which you could slide a guide tube and then make your guide by doing a suck down or acrylic bonding to that. Uh, it, it was a neat method. We can go straight to the guide now, so it's not necessary, but that's how I made this one. So the way I do most of my guided surgery, small crystal flat with a uh, lingually displaced incision, no releases. And then this is the guide that gets on, goes on. And again, that was made off a printed model. And so not uncommon at all for me, especially in the maxilla, to just use a single drill, like a pilot, like a 2.0, and then never pick up the handpiece again. A lot of times I will use these bone expanders. And so these bone expanders are great because it's, a, uh, it's the same idea as an osteotome. So if you're familiar with taking an osteotome and using a hammer and tapping it in there, you know, patients really love that feeling. Um, this does the same thing, but without the tapping sensation. So a lot kinder to the patient if you're not sedating them. And the idea is the same. These things, you crank them in slowly, they'll expand the bone, which gives you really nice bone to implant contact and really high primary stability. And uh, I expanded this up from a 2.0 and placed a 4.1 implant after doing the expansion. So knew I was placing a shorter implant. I wanted really high primary stability and really good bone to implant contact. And there is the implant in place. This was a Blue Sky internal hex, which is the Zimmer compatible implant. And so what was unique about this case is that I, I decided I wanted to try and do a two visit approach. So this is an MPA abutment that you see. Uh, these work on the uh, internal hex implants as well. So I placed the MPA abutment on there. And I'm going to use this as my impression transfer. Now, the way I used to purchase my internal hex implants, this came with it. So it's a really economical way of doing this. So I've already got the abutment in hand. I'm going to just do a surgical day impression because I don't anticipate the implant position is going to change in the next three months while this implant integrates. So I do the impression. Uh, in this case, since you can see a screw access, hole right here. I'm doing this as an open tray impression. Again, open hole in the tray for the transfer to stick through. And this is the impression. So not your typical implant uh, impression because you can see that I've got a flap in there. I've got blood all over the place, uh, but we'll fix that. So I sutured up the site and I will make note of something right here. Do you notice I, I said usually I like to make a lingually displaced incision. I want you to notice where this one is. It's right over the top of the ridge. So let's go back to the lab work now. So this is the same day that I placed the implant. I've got this impression now to work with. So I'm do, I've placed the analog back into it. I'm doing a soft tissue model on this. And you're probably thinking, why do a soft tissue model if the tissue looks terrible anyway? 
And really the reason is, is because I want to pour this up and you can see stone in that now. And here's the resulting model. And again, this is not accurate because this has got the tissue flapped and everything. But the beauty of pouring that soft tissue model is that then I can just rip it off real quick because those soft tissue contours are not that useful to me. I think you would agree. And so the challenge for me was how do I get the preoperative soft tissue contours back onto this postoperative model? And so I thought, well, we can do an altered cast on this. So the tissue is now removed. And if you remember, I, I made a guide on this patient preoperatively. So I have a preoperative cast, which means that here's the preop soft tissue on that site. So I'm going to make a little suck down on this. And here is that suck down that I made on this model. And now I've taken it over to my new working model and I've seated it over that. And I've cut away the excess where I can get under this. And now I have the ability to inject the, uh, the underside of this and fill it up, which will create the preoperative soft tissue contours back onto this model. It's just a, an altered cast method. And so here I am, I'm, I'm just using PVS material to do this. Uh, seat that on, inject up underneath it, and you can see it filling in all the tissue very nicely. And then once that sets, you can remove it. And now you've got a removable soft tissue cast. And so what I did is I wanted to go ahead and make my final restoration uh, before I even do a second stage uncovery. So I've, I've taken a burr and I've just sculpted the tissue to ideal. Now, normally our workflow is that we make an impression transfer and the impression transfer is usually shaped like a trash can, which is not shaped like a tooth and the body heals around that, and then we end up making uh, an abutment and a crown, and it matches that trash can shape uh, emergence as opposed to an ideal emergence. Well, what I wanted to do is create an ideal. So I'm just taking a burr and shaping this so-called soft tissue at this stage, and then I'm gonna make my restoration to fit that. And so here you can see that nice V-shaped emergence I've got coming out of the tissue. Now I've taken that same multi-purpose abutment, the MPA abutment, and I've prepped it. And this was only for a three and a half platform. And whoever asked the question earlier about, can you get a decent margin on that? You can see even with a skinny uh, MPA abutment, you can get that. And so I prepped this. And now I'm gonna use my CEREC to make a restoration on this. So here's an Emacs restoration. And you also had the question about screwmentation. That's exactly what I'm going to do in this case. You can see on my Emacs crown, I've now taken a handpiece and I've just punched through the top and created a uh, screw access channel. And so this is going to be a screw mintable restoration. So I can fire that in the oven, stain and glaze it. And again, this was all done the same day as the surgery, just in between patients. And this is her two day post op visit. And because it's all done, I thought, well, what the heck? Let's just, you know, hold the restoration up. And if I need to alter the color or something, I can do that. I got three months or so to, to change it. And you can see the, the shading looked really nice on this. So we're going to let the implant bake now. And I didn't see this patient until she came back for the three or four month recall uh, ready to, to restore it. In the meantime, I've gone ahead and I've extra orally bonded this dress this restoration to that prepped MPA abutment, and this creates a screw retained crown or a screw mintable restoration. Now I told you to make note earlier of where my incision line was because I regretted placing it right there in the middle. Something else that I regret is not getting her back another time after that two day follow up because this patient disappeared on me. I didn't see her until time to restore. And then first thing I looked in her mouth and I know, knew that this was a problem. Um, this is the little hole of death that you see sometimes if you're not careful and, and really watching your implants as they heal. Um, what this is, the reason I hate these is they kind of act like an operculum. I either want it completely uncovered and a healing abutment on it, or I want it completely closed. But I don't want this where you see that little uh, perforation of the tissue because bacteria and food and everything can get under that soft tissue and it can fester. It's not uncommon if you see this, that you push on it, you'll see a little purulence come out of it. So the advice on that is make a more lingually displaced incision more over here, because then uh, the body is gonna close that easier because it's got blood supply. If it's trying to heal over metal, there's no blood supply for metal. So make it over here, 
And the other advice I would give you on that is get your patient back on recall every three to five days until you see that this is either fully closed or it's not going to fully close. And if it's not going to, uncover this and put a healing abutment on it. All right, so this was, again, uncovery day. The implant integrated. I did have some crestal bone loss as a result of this scenario, uh, but still it was perfectly fine. Um, so I make a, an incision in the crest of the ridge. I'm going to deliver the restoration, which, again, was created months back. Torque it to final uh, torque and then fill in the screw access uh, hole. And then I'm going to coronally position the flap. Because remember, my goal in this is that I've created this restoration to have ideal uh, restorative contours to it. And so I want to pull that tissue up over it and make the tissue heal around it as it would a healing abutment. And so that's what we did by using a coronally positioned flap. And this hint ended up healing very nicely. Uh, you can see how the tissue has been pulled up and over the edge of this. And unfortunately, I don't have the follow up. This is a follow up x ray. Uh, but that healed very nicely, and it does look like a very nice uh, emergence to that. I'm sorry, I don't have that in the presentation. Any uh, questions on that presentation? Yeah, um, okay. scrolling back a little bit. Any problems with bonding interface and cements with the opaquer? Uh, no. No, the, the bonding interface, uh, it's, it's a composite type material, and so it's going to to bond on there and then your other resins are going to be uh, compatible to bond to that as well. So that's why I can put that. Okay. I always felt sometimes the bone expanders wander due to variances in bone density. Any suggestions on keeping path without drift? That is certainly a possibility, whether you use a rotary bone expander or a, you know, mallet and osteotome expander. And the reason is because let's let's say in the scenario I showed earlier, you may have a very dense uh, palatal bone or like in the mandible, very dense lingual cortex. And as you tap down, it's hitting this rock solid lingual cortex and the buccal bone is very soft. So, of course, what it will do is deviate over that direction towards the softer way. So you can't fix the fact that it does that. What you can fix is plan for it in advance. So if you know that you, you're gonna have soft bone on one side, start it more, uh, usually it's to the lingual, start it more lingually. And that way, as it does expand over, it will in, end up in the right spot. Uh, which is more to the buckle of where you originally started it. So that's just one of those deals. It's kind of getting the surgical feel for them and using them. Um, but usually I can anticipate the cases where that's going to happen to me and plan accordingly. Okay, comments that came in. You always start blowing everyone's mind at the end. Keep going. <laughs> I'm not even close to the end yet. What are you talking about? All right, so... Uh, customized impression coping. So we've talked some about uh, different ways of approaching these cases. This was a patient that was in a car accident, lost these teeth, um, and we've got to restore her back to normal. So uh, we did the guided planning, and so I used a guide to put a pilot drill in. This is that tool, and for what it's worth, this is a little tool. This says Premier Tool, I think, on it. Um, I think Salvin also sells something like this, but it's just a, a handle and you can, it's got a latch receiver in here. So you can put any latch type burr in that and then do your drilling by hand or your implant placement by hand. It's the best thing in the world for tactile feel and for using expanders, all of that stuff. I really recommend those if you can find it. I had it given to me as a gift, so I don't really know where to buy them, but I think Salvin has them and you might look into this Premier tool as well. So, uh, because I did it guided and because I've got a skinny ridge and I don't want to cause more bone resorption, I opted to do this case uh, with just a little mini flap on the crest. So two millimeter pilot drill. And then from there, I'm using all expanders uh, for the rest of the case. So here I am expanding up and I go incrementally in larger sizes until I'm to the uh, diameter I want to be in. And I've got that implant placed and now I'm doing the other one. And so here they are in their final position. I don't know if you can tell. Yeah, it's hard to tell here that I did start those a little lingually, again, in anticipating that it would want to walk me a little to the buckle. 
uh, that's usually the case in, in the maxilla. So we get the implants into place and uh, we just got these little H incisions and I decided I was going to try to immediately temporize her. So I needed to make temporaries. I placed some uh, plastic peak abutments on these. I don't currently think Blue Sky sells these, but you can get these from another number of uh, aftermarket sources uh, for compatible implants and from different labs to actually machine and make these. So you can find them if you want to. But I'm putting the plastic peak abutments on there. You could also use what Blue Sky does sell, which is tie bases. So you can also use those as a temp abutment, and that would do the exact same thing. So I prep them down a little bit and then I made this really ugly temporary. Now it's partly ugly because I've got facial emergence. I didn't have a choice unless I wanted to do block grafting or something on her. That's where they were going to emerge. And secondary, I don't want occlusion on this. So I've had to chop it down a bit on the occlusion, but it's certainly better than being toothless. So she was happy. That's the temp in place. And so she's going to wear this for four months and we're going to let the tissue heal around this. And this little H flap by pushing that keratinized gingiva back, we're going to get really nice bands of connect, uh, of connective, uh, I'm sorry, keratinized tissue around this temporary, even though it is ugly. Okay. And again, occlusion relieved. She's told to not breathe on these teeth. Don't look at them. Don't do anything on them. This was implant placement. And this was at four months. We see that the tissue has healed really nicely. Uh, everything's looking pink and happy. So we're ready to do the restorative process. All right. So what happens is I immediately take the temp off. I get that wonderful smell that you're uh, accustomed to getting when you remove a uh, internal hex style implant, temporary or abutment or whatever. And I've got these beautiful soft tissue contours. Couldn't be happier. I fiddle around. I'm trying to get all my impression transfers uh, ready to place on there. And within a couple of minutes, I'm ready to start putting components in. And I can't even push them down into the hole because the tissue collapsed so quickly. And so you need to be aware of that. If you've gone to great lengths to develop an emergence profile, unless you work really, really quick, you're going to get soft tissue collapse. Remember, you've got circular fibers in there that want to close it down and you're going to get soft tissue collapse. So the solution is either work super fast or you can do what I'm going to show you here, which is make custom impression transfers. So how do we transfer the soft tissue contours that we've worked so hard to get? Again, we're going to make custom impression copings. So what I do, she's got this temp that she's worn all this time and the tissue has adapted and modeled itself to this temp. And so I want to make my impression transfers the exact same as the temp. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to place some implant analogs onto um, this temporary. So there was a three and a half and then a three O on the other implant. I've placed analogs onto that and attached them. And now I'm going to make a super quick and cheap working model. This is, it isn't like pouring an implant impression. You're just trying to get a working model with the uh, analogs embedded in there. So to do that, I use, uh, again, bite registration paste. And I'm going to bury the um, apical half or so of this restoration and that abutment to inter, uh, implant interface. I'm going to bury that in impression material so that it creates this working model. OK, so this has got the implants analog in place. It's also got this Pontic if I was trying to maintain that Pontic space. And so what I'm going to do now is take those MPA abutments and I'm going to seat them on here and I'm going to make these MPA abutments into custom impression copings. So in order to do that, I need to fill in all this gap around here. So you can use whatever you want. Flowable composite, if you can get it deep enough to cure acrylic pattern resin, which is what this is. I think it was Duralay, whatever. It doesn't matter. Just fill in the gap with something hard. And now you've got these. They're going to index in in the exact same manner that the temp did. They've got this beautiful uh, tissue contouring that we've preserved here. So it's going to maintain all these nice contours that the temp had. So I put these in and look at how this is causing the tissue to blanch here because it's expanding back out all of that tissue collapse that I had. And so then you can do your open or closed tray impression. I would suggest if, if you're doing these to do it as an open tray impression so that this does not come out of the uh, uh, working uh, impression. 
And now you can proceed to do a soft tissue cast inside of this, pour up a working model, and you end up with a really beautiful working model to work on. Um, just because we are doing a restorative uh, webinar, I wanted to demonstrate some of the other ways there are of restoring implants. In this case, I had um, custom abutments made, but they were made not by milling, they were made by casting. So when you're making these, you notice these are made of gold. You're going to have to use a gold UCLA abutment. So you purchase this from Blue Sky Bio or whatever implant brand you're, you're using. Uh, the lab gets that. And what happens is it's got the built-in interface, which uh, is the actual metal or titanium. I'm not certain on the middle of that. And then you've got this, which is a waxing sleeve. And so what the lab will do is they will shape this, they will add to it, take away from it, and they will shape that into the abutment or in the case of like a UCLA screw retained crown where it's the whole metal substructure and everything but then they're gonna invest this and cast it. And when they cast it, it fills in all that gets burned out from this uh, waxing sleeve and anything they added, that will get filled in with the casting material, in this case, gold. So that's just a little different way of making custom abutments. Not a lot of this goes on anymore uh, because milling has become so prevalent, but there are cases where you'll have to do this. And uh, I've been really happy with the results I've gotten when I've done this. One other unique thing, uh, this case was done by Root Dental Lab in, I believe, Kansas City, Missouri. Um, this is a seating jig. They tend to provide these on most of their cases, and it's just cast and base metal. But it's really nice because it carries the uh, abutments in the proper spatial position into the mouth. So there's no second guessing and worrying if you have everything lined up correctly. You can also make these yourself on the, the model uh, before you see the patient out of composite or triad or whatever same principle, you're just going to make it around the abutment so that you can carry it in and index it properly. So the abutments go into place and then we had a PFM cemented restoration onto those custom abutments. Uh, high lip line saved us from this little pontic area right here and you know we had to work with what we had as far as our occlusion. It's a little off on the midline but I think it's a really beautiful result and turned out very well for her. Uh, so any questions on that? No, there's a question that came in before, if you know of any guided bone expanders. Guided bone expanders is going to be tough to accomplish because one, the, the guided, the bone expanders themselves are not cylindrical. So generally when you're thinking of uh, uh, these expanders, they're not cylindrical. They're mostly tapered. Um, in theory, you could create custom guides. Uh, I think that would work better for like the mallet and hammer style of osteotome because most of those do have a, a parallel wall. So you could just fabricate a guide at different diameters and then tap it in and it would follow your guide. You wouldn't even necessarily need a metal sleeve. Tap that thing in and hopefully it keeps your trajectory. But honestly, for me, it's been such an infrequent pr uh, problem once I kind of got used to how they worked that I just haven't ever bothered with it. Um, your other option, I mean, you can use the implant itself as a expander. So if you had the new fully guided kit where the implant itself gets placed through the stent, you could, in theory, uh, there would be limits to how much you could do with this, but you could make a pretty undersized osteotomy and then crank that implant in and you're going to have a lot of pressure as you crank it in, uh, but it would do the expansion itself. And so that would be a potential option as well. And it would maintain the guidance throughout. Okay. All right. Okay. So let's talk, uh, we've talked a lot about impression options and everything. Let's talk about the abutment level versus the fixture level impression. So I'm going to get on the soapbox right here. Um, if, if you've restored implants for any length of time and you look at this uh, x-ray, you know exactly how these were restored. And I'll give you a second if you want to think about it. This was restored with a conventional crown and bridge impression. So a lot of guys um, will say, they'll tell their specialist, I don't want to mess with screwdrivers. I don't want to mess with impression post. I just want to do an impression like it's for a crown. And I'm telling you, if you're doing that, you're missing the boat because that is not the ideal way of doing this. There's sometimes when it can't be helped and it can be made to work. 
but it's definitely not the ideal way of doing things. Uh, you're going to give up a ton on the contours of the restoration, on the smoothness of the accuracy of the margins and all that. Um, they're just not designed to do that. And so that's exactly how this case was done. It was a conventional crown and bridge impression. Um, this particular specialist placed these implants and then put this style of abutment on there, which you notice is just an infinity margin. And the reason he did it that way is because all his referring docs want it sent back to him so they can just take a crown and bridge impression. Well, if you made your abutment like this with an infinity margin, then wherever they can impress to, that now becomes the margin, the definitive margin. And you don't end up with a, a ledge or, you know, something to accumulate plaque down it. I just think these look awful on an x-ray. I just hate doing them this way. And it's so much harder. If you've not tried it these other ways, you really are making life harder on yourself. So please don't do this. It looks awful. Um, as an alternative, do it either closed tray or an open tray. And uh, when you place it doing the abutment level impression, which is what that was, I just showed you, you're making yourself have to do anesthesia, retraction, You've got to prep the abutments in the mouth usually to get them uh, prepared. It's very difficult to capture margins and it's difficult for the lab to pour it up without breaking it because, you know, abutments are skinny little things. They're very prone to breaking. They're like little skinny incisors. So a fixture level impression, on the other hand, is going to be much, much, much better and I think more accurate. Uh, that is where you screw an impression transfer into the implant and you take an impression. You don't usually have to have any anesthesia or retraction for these. It's accurate regardless of how deep that margin is. So in this case back here where this was a really deep subgentival margin, I don't have to worry about trying to capture that. It's going to be captured in um, the impression when we do this. It's a lot more accurate for the lab to pour, and it allows the design of an abutment to follow the soft tissue. So if you've got a seven millimeter soft tissue depth, the worst thing in the world you can do is now make an infinity margin and a cemented restoration. I can almost guarantee you're gonna not remove cement on that. So you can make your, your contours of the abutment to match what it needs to for the given tissue situation you have. Now, the exception to that is a kiss abutment because a kiss abutment is an abutment level impression, but it's different from what I showed you in the case I hated so much because those snappy transfers are going to pop on and they're going to capture all the margins and the integrity of it. So that's a different animal. And so I'm excluding that when I'm downplaying implant level impression or abutment level impressions. All right. Anything on that before I go into the home stretch? No, let's go into the home stretch. Cool. All right, so let's, uh, we've kind of built an intensity and, and complexity. We're gonna go now to full arch prosthetics and some of the ways to restore these because these really do take up the difficulty level uh, quite a few notches on implants. So uh, let me just first show you a recent case I did. This was a, a case collaboration I did with Dr. Uh, Nayef Sinata, I believe. Uh, probably butchered that, but this was a super cool case and I'm going to demonstrate some restorative aspects as we go on into it. So uh, I think this is the first case of its kind to be done this way. So the way we did this is uh, Naif is a, is a Prost resident in Maryland, amazing hands, amazing documentation skills. He worked this patient up and uh, this is the cone beam scan. We started out by doing bone segmentation within the Blue Sky software. Now we farmed it out, uh, but you could either use the Blue Sky software or the service that we use uh, uses the Blue Sky software uh, 3D image conversion. And they give us these nice STL models of the jaws. And the important part on his part was to start out with ideal dentures and use them as a scan appliance. Remember the whole premise of my talk is that your patients want teeth, they don't want implants. So don't just stick some titanium in there. They're not suffering from titanium deficiency syndrome they're suffering from not having teeth. So you need to put them in there where they need to be to support the teeth, all right? So he started out by making ideal dentures. These dentures are gonna be used as the scan appliances during the imaging. And what that allows us to do is then import the dentures into the, the software in Blue Sky Plan, and we can see this case uh, fully worked up here. Now he planned the implant positions, and so this is gonna be all on four upper and lower arch. And the implants are going to be placed in the kind of the typical all on four configuration where 
uh, straight in the anterior and then either 17 or 30 degree in the posterior to get the maximum AP spread. And so that's how these are going to be planned. And these are the emergence of the screw access channels once these angled abutments are put on the back. And this is just a cool shot showing you all these model outlines. You can see all the dentures, the bone outlines, just a really cool thing you can do in this software. It's amazing. All right, so here is the planning inside of the bone. Again, we're avoiding uh, the, the sinuses right here by angling these and giving us a more distal spread. Um, same here, we're able to keep it within the foramina where usually there's enough bone to work with, but we're gaining that AP spread by going posterior uh, with the angle. And then we can upright these with an angled multi-unit abutment. That's what I'm gonna demonstrate in this case. We place some guide pins because this is going to be a bone level guide. And so here was what was unique about this. We did create the stackable guide. That's that's actually been shown uh, for quite some time now. I, I believe Ibor Lab, I-B-U-R, uh, has been doing this for quite some time and does these cases routinely out of their laboratory. Um, what I'm going to show that's unique is the, the, re the transitional restoration that we created. So to start out with, all I did was create a, a guide, uh, per se, directly on the bone. I didn't have any guide tubes turned on whatsoever, and I drew a pretty generous uh, curve with the guide, and then I pushed Create Guide, and it gives me this, which is a guide with no holes in it. It's basically just sitting up there on the bone. And then I joined together that guide and this jaw, and I used the Blue Sky Cut tool, and this creates for me a bone reduction guide. And so that's a, a nice aspect to have when you've got to remove a lot of bone. You can pop this thing on and it gives you precisely the level you need to remove bone to. This was the emergence positions of those implants after I've done that. And you'll also notice I've, I've used Mesh Mixer to just create these little indentions into that bone reduction guide um, so that there's an indexing feature to this. And I, I will fully admit, this is not something most of you are going to want to try to do in the software. I highly recommend that you send this out to Ibor Lab. I'm just showing what's possible if you, if you were trying to do such a case and what the general workflow for such a case is. So then you can make the secondary guide. So you've got bone reduction that's been done now. You can pull it back in. You can make another guide. And you can see this has drill stops and everything on this. And this will seat over. Uh, the now reduced jaw and reduction guide, and we can do our, our uh, osteotomies through this. Okay, so again, nothing new necessarily to that point, but this was what I think is new, and I would love, if anyone knows otherwise, I would love you to, to let me know, because we may end up publishing this, and I would like to know it and give appropriate credit where it's due. If you are familiar with the software, you know when you import a scan appliance, it basically turns that denture into an STL. Well, that's very helpful if I go back a few uh, images. If you look at this image, this denture has now been imported into the case as an STL uh, file. Well, that's useful because an STL file, uh, we could reshape this and actually turn it into the restoration without having to have a lab design it and do all this stuff. Remember, the whole premise was that if you use this ideal denture as a scan appliance, it's fully seated in the mouth in the proper position during the scan. And so in theory, if, if you were to index this denture back onto the bone in the same position, the teeth ought to be in the same place. And so the way I did this was I, I took it in the mesh mixer. I cut the, the uh, intaglio out of this denture STL. I reshaped it. I made the underside to be smooth and I designed these little feet onto it where it could index itself back onto the reduction guide, which is going to stay pinned in place. And then I also used in mesh mixer, uh, what's called the Boolean subtract tool. Remember, I know where these, um, abutments are going to emerge from this. So if I do a Boolean subtraction, it will subtract out the abutment emergence from this restoration. So I thought this was pretty cool. And this is what it all looks like as we, uh, put it together. Again, NIAF did all the surgery and everything. Um, I designed it all. Burbank printed these for us, and they did the milling of this restoration. So, again, this restoration is nothing more than the STL that was created uh, when we imported the scan appliance. And then I just used Mesh Mixer to 
create a flat underside to this with about three to four millimeters of room between the implant platform and the underside of the restoration. I made it all nice and cleansable. And then I created, again, in Mesh Mixer, these little feet to index down into the reduction guide. And then Nayef came in, he uh, did some cutback on this. This is milled PMMA that Burbank did for us. And he did some cutback and added in the pink acrylic. Uh, this is how it all seats together. This is a the, the jawbone reduction guide. You can see what all had to be removed. Once that's done, the drilling guide seats on. And so we have everything we need prior to this case. And he's doing this double jaw, all on four surgery uh, on a non-sedated patient. And so that, that tells you a lot about how efficient this went, uh, that he was able to do this on a non-sedated patient. And again, you can see the whole premise here was that if we do everything properly and we index it all properly, this all should fit back in and be in the same spatial position for the right occlusion and aesthetics and all of that. So it all worked out beautifully and sexy on the printed models. The question was, is it going to translate that way to to the actual case. So here we are in the procedure. Again, all the treatment here done by uh, Dr. Senyata. Uh, this is the bone reduction guide. This is all that has to be removed. So uh, large burr is used to remove that down to this level of this platform. And then the drilling guide gets seated, the implants get guided into position, and then here they are. And now you look at this, and if you'll remember, these implants are at 45 degrees. So how is it that we have such an upright, up and down uh, positioning of these uh, paralleling pins? And the answer is that we used uh, multi-unit abutments. And so a multi-unit abutment can correct that angulation and allow you to seat this abutment, but then that gives you a new, hence the word multi, uh, a new platform onto which you can restore. And so I'll show you this in more detail as we progress. This is the cylinders on this. Uh, now he's going to do the pickup. And so again, the whole premise was that if it's all done correctly, we ought to be able to index this back into the bone reduction guide and it ought to seat over these um, uh, transfers and we ought to be able to do a very simple pickup. And in fact, as you can see right here, everything's emerging into those uh, he was able to do the pickup, then moved on to the upper arch. Same thing, bone reduction guide, implants in place. Uh, notice right here, this is the multi-unit angled abutment. This is a multi-unit straight abutment. We'll go into more detail on what that means, but the screw channel for this is like this because this was placed at a 30 degree angle. And yet when you place the multi, it uprights it and now it's parallel with these. So the titanium temporary cylinders go onto that. And once again, the restoration gets indexed onto this and picked up. Uh, and then this is the occlusion. It did require a little adjusting uh, as you would expect because there are little areas where things can shift around in this. But to get this level of accuracy um, in a double jaw conversion where it's all seating on the bone level uh, was, was pretty mind boggling. Again, I think that aspect has been done by a number of companies for quite some time now, but I don't think this uh, method of using the STL of the denture from the scan appliance to create the restoration. And again, please, if anyone knows if it has been shown, please let me know. Uh, this is how the patient went home after that surgery on the same day. So went from edentulous to full arch fixed top and bottom. So an amazing case. Uh, it was really a pleasure to team up with uh, Dr. Sinata on that and uh, came out beautifully. And hopefully next time I do a webinar, maybe we can show some more of the restorative aspects on that. This was the final x-ray. Uh, you're seeing right here the pin holes where the, pit, the guide was indexed in. And, and again, leaning back over these mental foramina, uh, leaning back, avoiding the sinuses. So just an amazing case. And he did an excellent job with the actual execution of it. Uh, so let's talk about understanding what these multi-unit abutments are. So we have two types. We have a straight and we have an angled. And the idea is that there's multiple levels at which these connect or to which you can restore on. So in the case of the straight multi-unit abutment, this part is going to go in and it's, an, it's going to engage into the conical connection, in this case of a Biomax implant. 
So it engages that conical connection, it gets torqued into place, and then never is removed again. Again, there's advantages to not removing stuff once it's in place. You can take advantage of that conical seal that a conical implant gives you where you don't have pumping of bacteria in and out. And because it's gonna be placed and never again disturbed, the tissue will get its attachment onto that surface and it's not gonna end up degrading away because you're constantly removing this on and off. Once this is in place, now this becomes the restorative platform and you're gonna restore it at the abutment level, okay? Same premise here with the uh, angled multi-unit abutments. These will come in either 17 or 30 degree multi-unit abutments, depending on how much angle correction you need. And you notice these actually have an indexing feature. So there's a particular way that these have to index into, uh, into the actual uh, implant analog. And so you're gonna seat this, and again, never to be removed again. That takes advantage of all the, the nice things about conical connections, uh, one abutment, one time concept. And now you can restore at the abutment level right here, which is gonna be the same kind of uh, platform that you're seeing right here, okay? So uh, same case that I just showed you, but I'm gonna demonstrate it kind of slow-mo now on printed models so you can see the, the nitty gritty details. Drilling guide goes on, implants go into place in their proper position in space, and now we need to start placing uh, the multi-unit abutments. So if you're able to, to get it relatively parallel, and, and you can even have a good degree of, of variation in, in angulation with these and still use a straight, because remember now we're restoring at this abutment level, and this is a pretty tapered design to this upper level of the abutment. So we're gonna place these usually uh, in the front. I find most often you need the straight ones, uh, but it can vary depending on how much angle correction you need to do. So in this case, straight multi-units on the front. I didn't need to angle it to get it any back behind the incisal edge. The back ones, I am going to need to do this. So again, showing the difference here. Now it's worth mentioning there's a difference in how you drive these abutments home. So in the case of the straight multi-unit abutment, Remember, we're gonna be restoring now at this level, which means we need to have screw channels at the top. Well, you can't exactly make a screw channel to drive this implant into the, uh, to drive this multi-unit into the implant if your screw channel is being taken up by this new channel, which your multi-unit uh, abutment has. So with the straight ones, what you're gonna to have to do is use this special tool and it more or less works like a socket wrench. You see how there's this, um, this hexed portion right here. It's just like a socket. It's gonna go over the top of this, almost like an external hex, and you're gonna drive it down and crank it into its full torque using that. Uh, not necessary to do that on the angled multi-unit abutment, so you can use your standard screwdriver, in the case of Biomax, an 048 hex driver. And because our screw channel is driving into the angle of the implant trajectory, it's gonna go in from this direction, but it doesn't interfere with the secondary connection, which is uh, what I've got this paralleling instrument or the, the little uh, handling tool screwed into. So all the components are gonna restore onto the multi-unit into this connection, which has now been uprighted from the implant trajectory you see here. I hope that makes sense. So here are the straight multi-unit abutments in place in the front. And again, they raise that up from now we're no longer restoring at the implant level, we're st restoring at the abutment level. Here it is being driven in with the insertion tool. This is the part number on the Blue Sky website if you need to order one of those. It's an 080 hex driver. And again, here it is the different abutments. And just a really close up showing you how the screw channel is going to angle into this. So you got to play with the alignment of these. The, the multi-unit angled abutments can be difficult to index them into the right position where, where it's uprighting it to your liking. And sometimes you may actually even have to play with the timing of the implant and rotate it a third of a turn or whatever. So the easiest way to do that and to deal with it is to put this positioning instrument on because now this becomes your, your handle. You don't have to worry about trying to carry this tiny abutment into the mouth under a flap and all that. This becomes a carrying tool and it's also your paralleling tool. So you could maybe have a cylinder on these front abutments 
and you're going to carry this in, you're going to position it into the implant, and you're going to find the indexed position where it most parallels these anterior implants. And once you've done that, you can drive the screw home and you can torque this to its final torque. And hopefully, if everything has gone according to plan, as I showed in the last case, that ought to be in the uh, same trajectory as where you've planned for it to emerge. All right. So once we've got the angled and the straight multis on, now we can put on the uh, temporary titanium tubes. These are the ones that Blue Sky Bio sells. Uh, you can see it right here. In this case, I'm using an impressioning long screw. So if you were doing like a pickup impression or something, you would want to maintain that screw access channel. That's what these long screws are for. And then once you've developed the, you know, the restoration, then you can seat it with just the, the small screws. So here are all the screws emerging through. Again, this is the case that I showed. I'm just doing it on models uh, now. Here's that restoration. This is just a 3D printed one. I've not taken much effort to pretty this up. Uh, but you can see it indexing into the reduction guide. You can see the cylinders emerging through, and now we need to do a pickup. And so in this case, I just use some white flowable composite just for demonstration's sake. And again, the whole premise of this is that we really need to start with the end in mind on this process. So I showed how we started with the end in mind on that last case. Uh, I think this is, I got two more cases if I'm not mistaken, but same premise on all of them. We've always got to know the restorative endpoint. And Michael, if, if there's any questions, this is probably a good time to clear some up since I've been going a little while. <laughs> okay. What degree of divergence can the straight of Bumman's handle? Can the straight one compensate for? And I used to know this, and I do not know it off the top of my head, but it's quite a bit. Um, I want to say 45 degrees, but please don't hold me to that. That might be something we could add in the comments after this. Uh, Sheldon has told me that before, and I just don't remember it. But it's a lot. Because of that ice cream cone shape to those uh, multi-unit tops, they really do forgive for a lot of angulation. OK, we actually just added functionality in the software that allows the prosthetic alignment of multi-unit multi abutments. Yeah, and that's going to be huge on these cases. So that's a new feature that's in our uh, newly live software. Um, are the stackable guides locked together somehow or just held in place in the indexes during surgery? No. It's however you make it or however your uh, lab, like Ivor or whoever, uh, would make it. Was that a pig? That was awesome. Uh, it's however you make it. So in my case, I made some little indexing uh, marks in the bone reduction guide, and then this thing stacked onto it, uh, and it I didn't have to have pins or anything. It just kind of indexed in place, and it held. Uh, so it's either or. You could do whichever one you wanted. Okay, and whether, you mentioned this earlier. What are some of the differences between the technique that you demonstrated and technique being done by Ibor and other labs out there? So, so the premise is the same. Uh, you've seen this from Ibor. You've seen this from Scott Gans going way back. He's published. Uh, you see if in sequence doing this. The, the premise uh, and the similarities between them all is the idea of a bone reduction guide and then an indexed drilling guide and then the indexed restoration. So the difference, uh, while they're all variations on the same theme, the difference in what I think I'm showing is how that uh, restoration is developed because it's a very much uh, streamlined workflow because you don't have to have now a, a lab designed in three shape or exocad restoration um, everything was already done when you did your imaging you basically designed your end restoration so it's just how i changed that it still indexes into the reduction guide and all that those aspects are the same across all of them it's just how i went about deriving that in a really affordable manner. Okay. Let's go on. All right. We good? Cool. So start with the end in mind. That means if a patient doesn't have teeth, you need to get them some dentures first and make a treatment denture so that you know what result you're shooting for. I've showed this case in my last webinar of the actual surgical aspect of this. So I'll show the restorative aspect now. But it started way back when, when we 
uh, developed a little treatment denture. And so we made sure we satisfied all the aesthetics and phonetics and function and all that stuff. And then we went to place the implants. All right. So, uh, the same way that we, uh, imaged the patient in my la in the last case that I demonstrated, this is what you would do to develop that restoration. If you've got an ideal denture, we can now do a dual scan technique. We can put radiographic markers onto that denture land area. We can scan them wearing it, and then we can scan the denture by itself. All right, so once we do that, the Blue Sky software, you can pull these scan appliances in, merge it all together, and here you see those dentures in place in the proper position. And then the denture can become the actual STL, or the denture STL actually becomes the guide. So Blue Sky Plan, if you do the Create Scan Appliance Guide, which you see right here, turn that denture into your guide. So it's a really easy way to plan these cases. And here you see the prosthetic emergence. And it's worth mentioning, I, I always say on these cases, in this case, it's a soft tissue born guide. And if you do a soft tissue born guide, your uh, guide is never going to fit any better than what the denture did when you imaged them. So if you put it in there and it's all over the place, probably not a good candidate for a soft tissue born guide, probably need to go bone level like the last case I demonstrated. And so these were the implants. Uh, you can look in the last webinar and watch the video of the actual placement and planning of this. This is where they all ended up, where I anticipated that they would. So let's talk about how to do the final impression. So I showed picking up the transitional, but at some point, you need to go from a transitional restoration, like in the last case, uh, when it's healed its proper amount of time, we'll need to go to a final restoration. So how do we do that um, on, on this case? So you could first consider the case of trying to restore it at the implant level, all right? So that would be using your traditional implant transfers. So you can see these are Biomax impression transfers through directly into the implant itself. And the problem with this is, you know, if you're going to get an accurate impression, you really need to splint this all together. And if you splint this all together, it's going to be taper locked into place. You won't be able to simultaneously remove this with this implant going that way and this implant going that way. They just are not parallel enough to pull themselves out at all those different angles. Now, the way you make these splints or the way I make these splints when I'm doing them in the mouth, and I just did this for demonstration, is I'll make a floss web first. I just go in and out, in and out of all these, tie it off, and that gives me a floss frame that I can now um, transfer by salt and pepper, Duralay, uh, whatever material. What I would use now and do use now is uh, called... Um, Oh, I'm going to blank on this. I think it's shown in my uh, uh, presentation later, but it's it's a light cured material and it is extremely accurate. It's only got a dimensional shrinkage of like 0.03, which is significantly less than any of your pattern resins or anything. Uh, G, uh, pattern red. I'm sorry. I'll, it'll come to me. But basically, you're going to lock all those together. But again, if you're doing it at the implant level, unless you have been super parallel with your placement, it's not going to happen. No way I could have placed these implants parallel in this patient. So we're going to need to do something else. One option we could do if we are intent on restoring at the implant level is we could impress it with non-engaging transfers. That means that there would be no portion that hexes in. And so it basically is just a flat to flat connection on the top of the implant. I think the last case I show demonstrates that, but that's not the ideal in my mind, uh, flat to flat connection. If you've got the advantage of a conical connection implant, I suggest you use it and not have that bacterial seepage in and out of the connection that you're gonna get with the flat to flat uh, type of connection. So instead we put on multi-unit abutments. And so this was the multi-unit abutments. I had to use a single uh, angled one on the top right here, uh, a 17 degree, and then I used 17 degree abutments on both of the lower back implants uh, on the bottom. And so that brought everything back up into relative parallelism. You can still see I've got quite a bit of divergence to the person's question earlier, and yet this is going to all draw perfectly fine on this. And then again, a couple of ways you could do this. You could make the floss frame ahead of time. 
I'm really anal retentive. So what I'll do is I'll make the floss frame. I'll create that in the mouth, but because all that stuff uh, shrinks when it's setting, once it sets, I'll go back and section them again and I'll fill that in with pattern resin. And the purpose for doing this, you could do a non-splinted impression, but the purpose for me doing this is if I do it at this stage, I get to skip uh, the step of doing a verification jig later on in the process. At some point, you need to make sure this is a verified impression. And what I mean by verified is that everything is seating simultaneously. You think about it, if you're making a one piece restoration, you've got to make sure that all of those uh, little cylinders inside of it engage and fully seat on those uh, various implant abutments simultaneously. There's not a little gap here on one or the other. Uh, this is why you usually have to do a verification jig. Uh, it's suggested you do the one screw test, which is where you put it in with one screw and then go look at the far most implant away from it and see if it's still seated. If it's a passive accurate model and your bar is passive, you ought to see that it's fully seated. If it's not and there's a gap between it, something messed up in the process and you're going to have to correct it with a verification jig. So I'm just accomplishing that all at the first impression visit when I lock it all together in this manner. OK, so I've, I've made the index, I've sectioned it, and now I'm going to re-loot them back together. And so here I am squirting that material back in between them. I'm going to let this set up and now I'm going to do an open tray impression open because the top of the impression tray is open and they're going to stay inside of the impression. We're not ever going to just pull it out. So I've modified the stock tray. Custom would be best if you are not lazy and we'll do that. So I'm ready to take my impression. I squirt the impression material everywhere around everything up under that, uh, that verifica verification jig to pick up tissue contours and then I unscrew all the screws once it's set up and this is my final impression. Now where we've been in previous cases showing that you would now put an implant analog onto this, these are multi-unit abutments and it's at the abutment level. So now you have to place on a multi-unit abutment analog, I'm sorry, a multi-unit analog. And it's going to look something like this, same premise. This part embeds itself down into the cast but what will be sticking up is this working portion. It's got the same little screw channel and all of these platforms are gonna be in the same place as they were in the mouth. Okay, then we do the upper, same manner, take an x-ray, make sure everything is seating fully passive uh, before you commit to this impression, because again, you don't wanna see gaps in here anywhere on this, and then you can do your open tray impression. All right, so once you've got the open tray impression, you can then um, use, let's say, a duplicate denture. If you might have one of those, that's what I wish I'd have done here. Uh, instead, I cost myself an extra lab step and I made a wax rim. So you can make a wax rim. There's no need to make it where it engages six implants, right? You can just do a couple of, of screws uh, to index it into place. And this becomes now a wax rim, just like you'd use in dentures, uh, only it's non-movable. So it's a little bit of a pain in the butt because it's in and out, in and out. You've got to unscrew stuff every time. But same premise, get the ideal occlusal plane, get the ideal midline, commissures of the mouth, buckle corridors, all of that stuff. You need to set it up, uh, get a face bow, pictures. Uh, this is the Coist Dental Facial Analyzer. And then some little uh, divots in it so that you can get a nice bite. And then this is the final bite. And so these will screw back on to the working model. And we can now mount this onto, in this case, the Panadent articulator. And these are the final mounted models. Now, I, I opted to do all this in my own office, which you could probably guess by the green soft tissue cast here. Uh, usually, most people would have the lab do this. Just up to you. I'm showing you all the steps, though. Lab then gives me back a. Uh, a screwed in wax uh, try-in of this hybrid that we're going to be making. So just like a wax try-in with a denture, you're going to put it in, you're going to verify phonetics, aesthetics, uh, all of that stuff, make sure the bite's good, changes that need to be made need to be done now because after this it's going to be the definitive restoration. And if everything was good, we send this back and it's going to be processed. 
And this restoration, uh, the lab work here was done by Burbank Dental Lab. Um, they do an excellent job on these full arch hybrid type cases and full arch removable for that matter. Uh, but this is, I think they call this their smart composite hybrid. Um, I'm not exactly sure on the name on that, but it's, a, it's kind of a unique restoration. And it's got the best of both worlds. It's got a milled titanium bar, which gives it strength and rigidity. And then on top of that, all the white that you see there is a, a monolithic milled puck of composite. It's a color uh, graduated uh, puck of composite so that you get those uh, nice color gradations in it. And that gets bonded onto the titanium framework. And then they hand stack on pink composite for the gum. And so it's kind of got a little bit of everything in that. But they're nice because the, the composite is forgiving on the occlusion repairable if they chip it. Um, I've had to repair one of these in the past and it, it worked really well to repair it with just my in-house composite. And then you've got the rigidity and the strength of the titanium underneath it. So if you wear these things out in a few years, you can, they've still got the digital file, take it off, send them the bar and they process back on this milled composite and you get to start over with a new one. A uh, pretty nice way of doing things. Here it was in the mouth. And you can notice that I have left off on the bottom left here, this second molar. That's because I had a large cantilever uh, and not very much anchorage uh, supporting these last two teeth with my maxillary implants, but I needed them for aesthetics. And so since we had tons of chewing surface here, the compromise I opted to go with was just not make matching occlusion on the bottom. It doesn't affect the aesthetics. Uh, everything came out really nice, and I didn't worry about that cantilever hurting the implants. And this was the final result. And you can see they, they look very natural. Uh, I've been very happy with the ones of these I've done that Burbank has made. All right. And this was, again, just showing the continuous uh, nature of the planning all the way through the end result. All my implants ended up where I anticipated that they would go because I planned them that way. And that's, again, what the Blue Sky software is going to allow you to do. And this is what they look like on an x-ray. Uh, again, you're seeing multi-unit abutments and it raised it up from an implant level restoration up to an abutment level restoration, um, letting you use the conical connection, take advantage of not having to remove this uh, uh, restoration multiple times and disturb that tissue interface. So really nice way of doing these. And uh, again, helps you maintain uh, parallelism even when you've got wildly out of the line implants like this one or these. All right, I uh, believe this is last case I'm gonna show. Any questions uh, on that? There's a question that came in before. Do you have a problem with the digital scan of skin bodies with multiple implants like the trio skin? I can't speak for anything uh, other than the Serac Blue Cam because that's the only one I've owned. And in the cases I've done, uh, one, two, three implants side by side, you're going to be fine. When you start trying, trying to do cross arch, um, you're not going to have the accuracy if what you're trying to accomplish is like a, a screwed in restoration like you're seeing here. And to my knowledge, that goes for all of the uh, intraoral scanners that are on the market right now. We're just not there. So if you know how these things work, um, you can do it with a desktop like a lab scanner, but that's a different animal. It's, it's a calibrated scanner that's shooting the same model in the same position and changing angles and doing tons and tons of images and calibrated uh, from all angles. It knows what it's looking at. And so that's a different animal and can get very accurate uh, results and make restorations like this. But an intraoral scan, you've got patient movement. Um, as you go cross arch, it's stitching all these little images. And with each stitch, there's maybe a tiny bit of deviation. And so you're not going to get that same level of accuracy. I hope that we do eventually, uh, because that will really make life easy once we can get that level of accuracy. But right now, if what you're talking about is for a, a restoration like this, uh, we're not there yet. Okay. All right. So last case I'm going to show, uh, this was a patient that had a pretty severe gag reflex and uh, terminal dentition. I was not able to place these implants on him because he needed sedation. So my oral surgeon, Dr. Matt Nichols, placed these, did an excellent job. Uh, he took out all the teeth, and these are the implants in place. And this is after I've restored him, obviously. Uh, what you're seeing there is a hybrid. 
and you see that there's this indistinct titanium bar that's on that. And I hope that you remember to be wary when you start seeing these because these have been a thorn in my side. I do not do these anymore. And I'm going to show you how I overcame that. And why is it that I don't do them anymore? Because usually at about the two year mark or whenever the lab warranty runs out is about when you start seeing this and you start breaking teeth off. Now there's a number of reasons for that. I didn't know what I didn't know at the time. And I've got a pretty aggressive occlusion on this. Uh, you can see a pretty deep overbite minimal over jet, which means that he's always beaten on those. And then going back to that titanium bar, you look at where he's broken these teeth out. Um, and he repeatedly did this there. I just eventually realized I was going to have to remake this. There was no fixing this one, but I look at this titanium bar and you think about this is just denture teeth and acrylic processed onto that. Now think about with, with a fixed, uh, it's not fixed, it's uh, implant supported on the bottom, he can generate a lot of bite force, he can generate excursive movements, and how much acrylic do you have on the facial side of these teeth? You're getting this inside out pressure applied from the lower arch, and there's no metal extending from this bar into these teeth, there's no acrylic on the outside of it, and really all that's embedding this tooth is a tiny little lip of acrylic that you see right here, and once that breaks, you know, you're in trouble. The teeth are going to start displacing and it's a nightmare for you and the patient. So this was a very expensive lesson to learn. I just do not do this type of, of restoration at all period anymore. Um, I'll show you how I modify that design now, um, which has made a big difference for it. Uh, to boot on that restoration, when I removed it when, and was going to send it to the lab, I look under it and I see, you know, half of his lunch right here. Uh, that's never a good sign for a restoration. That means they can't clean the thing. And you can look at it and tell why these are all concave areas. And so you need to make every effort to make the underside of your full arch implant restorations convex so that the patient can cleanse it and uh, maintain these implants better. And this is that um, kind of nasty tissue as a result of that. So I've got to start over. I actually still had his working cast, which had been a verified cast. And I thought at least I've got this going for me. I can just start to work on this. So I need to remount this model to his current lower denture. The way I did that was I took a bite of him in this state. I did a, an occlusal bite. And then I took that and I uh, mounted his lower model against that bite and I used his uh, hybrid. I just stuck it back onto the working model and I mounted the casts back up. So I very easily have mounted cast and I can give him back his broken restoration to walk around with. And now I'm going to start setting teeth. So I'm going to set the teeth and this time I'm going for more over jet and over bite or less over bite uh, to give him some space. So he's not beating these teeth up so much. So there's the setup lingualized occlusion. And there we go and then festoon this and then go ahead and invest this. Uh, so what I would suggest you do if you're going to do this is if you're trying to do it in house and accident makes this thing called, I think it's just called the large flask, but it's a flask that you can use to invest things and you can actually do your own in house uh, acrylic processing. It's a really cool deal. Um, I bought it just for this case because I just couldn't stomach spending another $3,000 to have a hybrid remade. So I'm going to do this whole case in-house, make the hybrid myself, and I'm shooting to do it under 300 bucks. So I'm investing this. The cast is, is on the lower member of this flask, and I'm investing it in a PVS, uh, very accurate and dimensionally stable and hard, short hardness uh, PVS material. It's a putty. So I've done that with the high detail putty and then I do it with the uh, matrix 70 B, which is the uh, higher shore hardness material. And we're going to index this into the flask. So when I open it up now, I see just like if you were doing traditional denture processing, you would break open that flask and you would have this, uh, but it would all be in stone. It's the same idea. It's a denture investment, but in PVS putty. All right. And you can see that here again. So now before I break the teeth off, create an index of these incisal edges. And now I've removed all the teeth again. I'm back down just to the working model and I've placed on some titanium cylinders. 
I'm evaluating with that little index that I just made, where are my cylinders going to emerge? And thankfully they were all lingual to incisal edges or buccal surfaces. Um, and I start now trying in the teeth. And so I see that there's some areas I'll either have to adjust the cylinder or the teeth because they can't occupy the same space. So we can do that very simply off the jig that I made once again. And this is kind of what it's looking like. Now, this is a uh, little thing I snipped from uh, Attachments International's website on the CAL technique. So the way I'm doing this so affordably is utilizing a technique that's been around a long time. Uh, Dr. Lambert Stumpel has uh, uh, published on this, but it's called the CAL technique, California Adhe Adhesive Looting Technique. And what it allows you to do, let me first set up the problem for you. I've talked at length about how difficult it is to achieve that very accurate working model where everything seats passively. And truthfully, while we can get finished restorations that seat passive to our eye, there's really no such thing as true passivity. And that's because there's, you know, impression material moves a little bit, the looting jig uh, shrinks a little bit, stone expands a little bit as it sets. When you optically scan this or, or cast it, there's minute errors that happen in there. So the end result is usually if we do it all right, we get good enough, but you don't ever get true passivity. The CAL technique is going to allow us to get across multiple units in like a bar restoration or in a splinted bar like inside of a hybrid to get true passivity. And the premise of how we do that is with these CAL cylinders. So these are intended to go on top of multi-unit abutments. And if you look closely at what it consists of, there's an inner titanium cylinder, which screws on just like what I showed you a moment ago. There is a green uh, shim spacer. And then on the outside of that, there's this waxing sleeve. And so the lab technician or you is gonna create the bar by just using a Primo pattern. That's the resin I was trying to think of earlier. You could use uh, pattern resin or light cured Primo pattern from Primo Tech. And you could quickly create this bar, uh, which can be cast. And then you pull it off of these cylinders. Um, the cylinders pull out, that green spacer pulls out. And what you end up with once you cast this is a, a bar or a framework that has a uniform, uh, I'll call it a slop space. Basically, it's going to have a slop space of everywhere in between the metal cylinder and, and that waxing sleeve. Uh, everything you see in green there is going to be a very small slop space. It's about 0.3 millimeters. And what that allows you to do is now pick this up. And so you'll pick up the cylinders with a resin cement. And the resin cement shrinkage is so minute and it's in such a small area that now you can get true passivity and uh, it's the best of all worlds because it's a super cost effective way of making it. And two, it's, it's simple. You don't need a verified cast because if you got a little error, so what? You can make up for it in the slop space uh, of that green spacer. So hopefully that makes sense. Difficult technique to teach from a webinar. I'll just tell you that. This is what they look like. Spacer, titanium sleeve, waxing sleeve. It all goes on together. Now, here's the problem. These things, these are not uh, CAL cylinders. I'm restoring this at the implant level, and these are just non-engaging titanium cylinders. I sure wish there was a CAL cylinder for this because it would have made my life easy, but there's not. So I had to MacGyver a way around this. And the way I did that, the way I created my, my spacer or the slop space is I just started wrapping Teflon tape around this. So I've wrapped the Teflon tape onto this to create uh, roughly about a 0.3 spacer. And here you see that I've put them back onto the cast. And here's that material I couldn't think of earlier, Primo pattern. Uh, it's a light cured material with super, super low shrinkage, like 0.03%, if I'm not mistaken, or 0.3%. Um, but it's you flow it on like flowable composite almost, and then you just light cure it, and boom, that's it. And so I'm creating a bar or the, the framework of this hybrid that I'm making out of this because it's all going to get cast. This all can be burned out and cast. And once I make the initial bar, I'm going to cut some retention holes into each of these teeth. Because remember, I told you I want to have some metal extending up into each tooth for retention and for stability. 
excuse me. And then the way I did that is I put a little Teflon in between the, the teeth. I squirted in some of these into the holes that I'd made and I closed it together on the articulator and zapped it with the light cure. And when I opened it up, this is what I've got. I've got this uh, like a pin retention up into each individual tooth. And you can kind of see what I was going for there. So this is going to be far more supported than that tooth that only has a tiny little rim of acrylic that I showed you in the original hybrid. All right, so this was the final, uh, let's say, bar that I waxed up, and I put in these cross arch bracing aspects just to keep it stable en route to the lab. And so this just needs to be cast. And so I talked to my lab, this is what I need. Uh, this is how it fits under my tooth setup. Remember, I've indexed all that. When I undo it, this is the uh, cylinders inside, and this is just gonna pull right out, because remember, it's Teflon tape. It doesn't stick to anything, those will pull out. And what it leaves me with when I stick it back onto the cylinders is this slop space. Uh, that's our spacer, which will get filled with cement. All right. So I hand this off to my local lab technician. I just said, hey, man, I just need a strong, uh, you know, non-noble metal, uh, just something that's biocompatible, you know, chrome cobalt, whatever. It doesn't matter. Just give me something strong and affordable. And he cast this for me. 150 bucks. Okay. So it's hard to beat 150 bucks for a, a full arch bar. When I bring this back to the working cast, um, you can see again, it's exactly like what I had. And if there's a little casting warpage or error, so what? Remember, it doesn't matter. We've got a built in margin of error into this case. So now I'm going to sandblast these tie bases. I'm going to fill this uh, screw channel so it doesn't get cement in it and sandblast the frame. And I'm going to pick these up with a resin cement, in this case, multi-link implant cement. We'll fill that up, wipe off the excess, and I do that on all of these different cylinders. And this is the end result. And if you look real closely, you can now see this is the definitive bar. Um, you've got the cement filling in that slop space uh, or the spacer. Uh, it looks a little sloppy to this, but remember, we don't care at all about that. That's perfectly acceptable. What we're going for is the accuracy from doing it CAL style uh, of having a passive framework. And we're also going for the strength of this metal. OK, now I will say I picked this up on the um, the model. The ideal way and the pre preferred way of doing this is to actually pick it up in the patient's mouth. There's no truer test of passivity than in the patient's mouth. We were on a time crunch. I had to get this done. Uh, I knew it had worked for the previous restoration, so I made the, the judgment call to go with it and do it on the, uh, the model here. But in ideal world, we would do the pickup in the patient's mouth. All right, so here's the finalized framework. And now I just need to process teeth onto it. Again, you could farm this out if you want to. I wanted to try and do it in-house. So this was my investment on the Annex Dent Flask. Uh, you make a small and a large hole. These are going to be where you inject the acrylic into it. And you put one back here, one back here. And you're going to inject in here, let the acrylic flow in, fill in all these little nooks and crannies within this once it's closed up, and uh, put it in a pressure pot and let it set. So I'm priming my framework with acrylic primer. I've closed the flask back up. The teeth are in this side of the flask and I'm ready to inject acrylic. So I mix up the NX dent acrylic to the proper uh, proportions by weight, put it in their syringe and I inject it, making sure not to trap air. And once I'm sure I've got all the air out, I stick it in a pressure pot for 20 minutes and let it harden. And when it comes out, this is what I have right out of the flask. OK, this is all done in house. Uh, the acrylic cost me next to nothing. Really, at this point, my expenses have only been the teeth, uh, the processing of that framework and the cylinders. So very affordable. Remove the sprue, open back up your screw access channels. Get out the Teflon tape and this is what I've got. Remember, I also told you at the start of this case that we want to avoid having these concave areas. And because it was just directly processed on the cast, we still got concave areas. So how do I fix that? I'm just going to salt and pepper it. And so I added salt and pepper acrylic and made convex contours to this. And this is a much more cleansable situation. Uh, we took it to the patient's mouth. We screwed it in, delivered it. And this is going to be much stronger 
in all respects, and it's going to be much more cleansable for him. Uh, if I could do it again, the only thing I would do is opaque that framework because you can see a little bit of darkness right here where it showed through the acrylic. Uh, that's a minor issue. It doesn't show with his lip line, and this was the final x-ray on that. So just a different way of approaching the cases. And what I'm working on now is being able to do all that digitally where you don't have to manually do all this lab work. And so I have no doubt at some point that will be a, uh, integrated into Blue Sky Plan and we'll be able to do that technique even more affordably. And you won't even have to do the casting uh, or the, the wax up. You'll have to just 3D print the bar uh, have it printed in a castable resin, same thing, give it to a lab to cast for $150, uh, and then you could still process it the exact same way, or we may have some even newer and greater way of processing it at that point. But with that, I appreciate your attention. Uh, again, Blue Sky Bio Academy, if you want to look us up, we've got the, the comprehensive online training for all things digital dentistry. If you need to contact me, that's my email, and I'm happy to help you. And with that, I will quit probably let you go to sleep, Michael. <laughs> Corey, that was a phenomenal presentation. I think we just hit around the two and a half hour mark. Wow. That's Which not even my longest, is it? <laughs> I, I was just going to say, it's only matched by the last presentation that you gave. <laughs> yeah, I, I get a little long-winded on these, but hopefully it was worthwhile. I definitely think so. Tremendous amount of information and knowledge that you passed over. Um, I think everyone that attended really appreciate, appreciated it. Um, come, people are commenting very good. Thank you very much. Fantastic presentation. You know, and, and and as always, thank you very much for the time and efforts that you put in to the Blue Sky Bio Academy and helping dentists and Blue Sky Bio in general. It's very much absolutely the most most fun job in the world. Um, and for everybody that attended, please, if you haven't yet, filled in the webinar attendance form so that we could send you the CE credit. If you have any questions, Corey's email address is on the screen. Any questions regarding the software, you can contact us at plan at blueskybio.com as well. Um, stay tuned for upcoming webinar presentations, upcoming updates with the software, and uh, we hope to see you at another presentation uh, shortly. Um, right. Last comment that just came in. I knew it was coming. My mind is fully blown. Thank you, Corey, for taking <laughs> the time. Best of luck. Well, I'm, I think I'm glad I did my job. I think that summarizes the comments that came in. Well, anyway, thank you. Corey, thank you very, very much, and thank you, everybody, for attending. All right.